How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thanks. Awesome. So, yeah, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, essentially how uh, Lean and Six Sigma have influenced the amazing career of Guy Wallace and how, uh, you know, you, you, you have a very unique perspective with your time at Motorola and how um, your mentors and, and uh, people like Gary Rumler, uh, people that were foundational to uh, our standard practices today, uh, you know, the ins and outs of what happened and how. And uh, and so today I'd like to talk about your how Motorola, Lean Six Sigma, or, or Lean and Six Sigma has influenced your career and uh, how that has influenced your perspectives on what it means to be an instructional system designer and human uh, uh, performance technologist and how Gary Rumler, um, his thoughts uh, and how, uh, and then of course your own curriculum architecture design, the, the Lean ISD, uh, your, your, your own vast body of work that uh, I'd like to talk about. And, and of course, uh, any advice that you have for brand new instructional systems designers, human performance technologists, um, and just as an, uh, you know, uh, a lead for that, one of the major things that's happening right now, uh, is there seems to be a lot of teachers in particular that are wanting to get into the instructional systems design profession. And my concern with that after a lot of thought and reviewing a lot of the material is that if I have the approach of a content, if I'm focusing on content, if I'm focusing on um, uh, so in the vast majority of teacher plans and, in, and teacher uh, training programs, the focus is on, well, I'm to teach math and here is the content that I'm supposed to teach and my standards are already built and established and I have to teach to those standards because that's what I'm going to be assessed by uh, and, and you know, above all else, people respond to incentives. Uh, so whatever there's, uh, uh, so I would very much like to talk to you, you about what your thoughts are for someone that's coming from the teaching profession. What would you tell them, you know, uh, as they get into it? And remind me, and perhaps we'll talk about uh, uh, Harry Wong in the first day of school. He wrote this book called the first day of the the first days of school, and it was like your your preparation for uh, what it meant to be uh, a good teacher. And uh, so those are the things I'd like to talk about today. Uh, starting with Motorola, uh, I, I'm really excited about this. All right, so I'm going to have to back up one job before Motorola to set the context for Motorola because they, they really string together. So my, uh, I graduated from college in August of 1979, and I went to Saginaw, Michigan to Wix Lumber, and I joined a 10-person training and development organization. And in that 10-person organization, besides there being another guy who became guy one and I was guy two, Gary Rumler's brother-in-law worked there. And the two people that I was going to work with had just arrived a week earlier from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Detroit, where they had worked with Gary Rumler's brother, Rick Rumler. And the, the brother-in-law was instrumental in getting those two people coming because they were recommended by Gary Rumler because they, they were known to him because at Blue Cross Blue Shield, they were implementing a lot of the things that Rumler and Tom Gilbert were doing at their organization called Praxis. Uh, for a number of years, and then and then that business practice uh, uh, was uh, let go, and uh, Rumler did some other things in between. But so so I spent 18 months there, and but on day one I was given three things. I was given a 1970, so it was nine years old, uh, mimeographed uh, article uh, about from 
Praxis. It was their newsletter for September and October of 1970, and it talked about guidance, which we all know knew later as job aids and which we know today as performance support or workflow learning. But guidance and how guidance could be used in place of training so we didn't force people to memorize everything. We could give them this job aid, this guidance, and they described several different versions of it. And I was told that we were going to be doing most of our training, we were going to be providing guidance. Um, the second thing I was given was Bob Mager's book, Analyzing Performance Problems, or You Really Got a Lot. <laughs> classic book, still good today. Yeah, uh, I was also given Tom time. Gilbert's recent book, because this was 1979, and his book came out in 78, Human Competence, which it took me three times trying to read through it to get through it. But so that's another story, but there's a lot of lessons learned in that. But anyway, so I was I was uh, oriented to a Rumler and Gilbert approach to instructional systems design and development. Back in the old days, you know, ISD stood for instructional systems development and ID stood for instructional development. But, you know, design is cooler than development. And so it all shifted then back in there in the uh, late 70s and early uh, 80s. But um, so I, I was taught and I was told this because later on when I got a chance to meet with Rumler, I told him I was taught a derivative of a derivative of your approach, Gary Rumler's approach to analysis, performance analysis. And that then led to um, what Tom Gilbert called in his book, Human Competence, a knowledge map. And my organization changed things around, changed the formats, changed the labels on these things. So we produced a performance table and a knowledge map, but we then soon changed it and I soon changed it to become a performance model instead of a job model because oftentimes we're looking at more than one job and a knowledge matrix. And so those things were instrumental early on, 18 months of practice with that. My wife at the time got transferred to Chicago, so I got a job with Motorola simply because on my 16 page saddle stitched resume, because the people at the print shop at Wix Lumber loved me. Um, at, at the bottom of page one, it said, practitioner of the methods of Gary A. Rumler. And so I sent this off to a whole bunch of companies in, in the Chicagoland area. And a woman at Motorola, Barbara Warbritton, was opening the mail for the new director who hadn't arrived yet, a guy named Bill Wiggenhorn. And so she was going through his mail, sorting junk and throwing it away and saving things in a pile. And she saw this resume, which, of course, was quite distinctive because it was 16 pages saddle stitched, you know, in in color um, and which was very unique. And, and at the bottom, she saw this thing, Gary Rumler. And she said, well, I, well, he's this guy, Gary Rumler. I don't know who he is, but he's coming to speak to us in a month or so. And uh, so I better set this aside and put this on top for Bill Wagenhorn when he arrives in a week or so. I can't wow. detail the story. But anyway, so I got hired. Um, they invited me to come to work a week early before my official start date and attend a one day workshop that was being put on by this guy named Gary Rumler. Now I'd met Rumler at the NSPI, which is now ISPI conference in April of 1980 in Dallas. And I, so I got a chance to meet him, but he wouldn't necessarily remember me because he didn't remember me when I showed up to this one day workshop. And, you know, I told him, OK, I, I work with your brother in law. Oh, so, OK, yeah, he kind of knew the connection here. But, you know, I was new into the business and all of that. And so at Motorola, I was my clients were the manufacturing materials and purchasing worlds. And. Uh, Bill Wiggenhorn set me up. I didn't have a what was called a functional manager. So I skip level reported to the top guy, Bill Wiggenhorn. This was a brand new corporate training organization. It, there hadn't been one for 10 years. It had all been distributed up to the field to the strategic business units, which were called business sectors at Motorola, five of them. And that wasn't working. But so Motorola was it had embarked on this effort to to put install a participative management system and they called it PMP, the Participative Management Program. And this is really goes back to uh, Lickert's um, 
system four organizations, four systems that he articulated. And the fourth one was a participative where you're listening to the people on the front lines and that's affecting decisions at the top of the organization. So there's all this two-way flow of communications and all that stuff. And the uh, founder's son, who was the CEO, decided that he was going to put in a training organization, a new corporate training organization to help with this huge initiative. They were doing this because Motorola was famous for communications. A lot of the people uh, in the company had come out of World War II. They knew that, you know, Motorola radios that took a bullet or two still worked. And that's why they had huge market share after the war. And that was all beginning to uh, dissipate, get lost to Japanese competition because the Japanese quality improvements had been uh, improving radically over the last couple of decades before this. Uh, there was a famous NBC video white paper called If Japan Can't, Why Can't, If Japan Can, Why Can't We? This was very impactful to a lot of people in the manufacturing world because um, our quality, which had been superior after World War II, simply because we had bombed the heck out of everybody else and they didn't have manufacturing capabilities, and capacity, you know, we yeah. sold the refrigerators, we sold the cars, we sold everything to the world, including communications devices, radios and such. And so that was all beginning to change and huge changes in the and the top executives at Motorola decided they really needed to do something about this. So we needed, this, and they looked around and they discovered this. And so they embarked on this program to do that. Um, but anyway, so I got a chance to work with Gary Rumler. He was assigned to me. So he was my consultant on my projects for manufacturing materials and purchasing, which, and the joke was, you know, that meant I carried his pencils around as we went from site to site and client to client. <laughs> and I learned a tremendous amount from him. Um, and it, in fact, uh, I was there at Motorola 18 months before I left. And uh, in May of 82, about five months before I left, I wrote a white paper because of this NBC video white paper, but I wrote a paper white paper. I forget how many pages it was, 17 or, or 27, something like that. Um, and where I recommended to Motorola, because my manufacturing clients and materials clients and purchasing clients were complaining about this PMP program because there was gain sharing, but people had figured out how to game the gain sharing program. So, you know, savings that were had and people could get money for it and all the, all the metrics that were behind all this stuff were easily gamed and people were gaming it. And so there was a lot of dissatisfaction in my client groups. I had 30 manufacturing sites that I was responsible for uh, helping them with you know, training. If it met three out of the five business sectors needs, then I would do something for them. And uh, so there, there was all this dissatisfaction. So I wrote a white paper because I'd been there about you know 13 months at that point. And I said, you know, what we really should be doing from the corporate training organization is taking what we're learning from Gary Rumler and his process orientation, because that's what's really unique about Rumler. He looked at the processes, the tasks and behaviors of the process that produced outputs, and there's a receiving system down there, and they get to judge whether that output is a good input to them or not, blah, 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 and then give feedback and consequences and all that in his models. Um, and that they, we should take all this Rumler stuff and combine it with all the quality, the total quality management movement, which had previously be call, been called VR for variability reduction. Because mm -hmm. if you want to improve quality in your product, you reduce the variation of the product by reducing variation in your process. And, yeah, and, and so all these quality tools that basically there's like a pile of tools it's like task analysis that's not done very well. There's just a whole bunch of stuff and it's not organized well and you don't know when and where to use it and all that stuff. So I had suggested that they combine all of this quality tools with the Rumler stuff. And part three, I was learning from Neil Rackham who later wrote the book, Spin Selling. And he was implementing Spin Selling at Motorola. And so I got uh, uh, exposed to all that. In fact, the, the Hathaway group back in England in Sheffield had a negotiations program that was built on the same foundation of communications behaviors. And so they had a way to delineate and, and count 
you know, how many of this kind of behavior did we see at this point in the process, at that point, and this point, and that point. And so I was tasked with doing the negotiations for the purchasing world. And my, uh, and there were other target audience, such as salespeople at Motorola. And there were um, people who negotiated government contracts, you know, sell a couple black boxes for $4 billion each, and you can't tell anybody what's in those things, secretive stuff. Anyway, those were my clients. And so I worked with Huthwaite in Sheffield, England to bring their negotiations program back to America. And so I got exposed to all that stuff. So I said, you know, the Rummler process orientation is great. We ought to combine it with all these quality tools. And we need to teach people these communications behaviors because communications is key. If you're not communicating well in sales or negotiations or every time you communicate, then something's going to go wrong. Anyway, so I wrote this white paper and my boss, uh, he he wasn't too sure about this, but Bill Wigginhorn kind of liked this. We had a couple of meetings with Rumler in New Jersey to talk about all this stuff. But my boss converted the whole idea to what he called a do-it-yourself Gary Rumler consulting kit. And we have pictures of him wearing a kit Superman t-shirt with a big <laughs> kit across instead of the S. And we worked with Rumler to begin to create uh, this thing um, and that turned into a training course called OPS, Organizational Performance Systems. Um, and then I left Motorola. Uh, I was given an opportunity to join another one of the consultants like Rumler, like Rackham, this guy, Ray Svensson, who had come to us. He did a one-day workshop, just like I saw with Rumler. The next week, I, my first day on the job, we had a one-day workshop with Neil Rackham. Those two are on video. Then Ray Svensson came in a month, a month or two later and talked to us about strategic planning for the training function, which was his thing. He had done strategic planning at at and and Bell Labs. He was a Bell Labs engineer. Um, and he talked about in, within this strategic planning for training thing that about this concept of curriculum architecture, which had come from the Bell System Center for Technical Education in Lyle, Illinois, and the IT group. They'd re recently been MIS, you know, Management Information Systems, and they went to IT, bumping instructional technologists, taking the title away from them. We couldn't call ourselves ITers anymore because information technology stole the IT, you know, acronym. Yeah, it was uh, so, so, uh, I know, I, I know that PM. Uh, PMI wouldn't be uh, too pleased with someone new coming up with a PMP. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so that all that stuff, all of our language goes back and it's all been changing. And that's why we have all sorts of issues with it. Um, just other than that's human nature also and marketing, the nature of marketing. But uh, so he talked about this thing called curriculum architecture. And he, he was there and then he worked with Bill Wigginhorn and I never, I didn't see him again. But then I took the ideas that he had talked about and implemented it on a project that I had. So I had a, a training and development path. It had five swim lanes, if you will. I had, here's content that's core for everybody, every supervisor and every manufacturing facility. I don't care where you are, you need this. And then you need this. And here's five different things for you because you're at different businesses. And here's 30 different things because you're at different facilities. In fact, I used, created a lot of templates, which were fill in the blank, you know, to train yourself. Here's a template, fill in the blank, go figure out this information, interview your boss, interview your peers, interview, you know, other people, your clients, upstream, downstream, suppliers, whatever, and fill this in. And now you've created this, your training package, your own job aid, if you will. You know, who's who, what's their phone number, you know, et cetera. This was in the days before email really came about. Um, and so... I did this curriculum architecture. I had my cubicle had, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 flip chart pages taped together with these street oh, uh, swim lanes going across them with all this content organized on this thing. My clients, the manufacturing operations managers, 30 of them at Motorola, loved it because this was going to be unique to them. That's a bunch of generic stuff that didn't apply easily. This was for you, about you, no matter where you were in the, in the system. Well, Bill Wigginhorn saw this and kind of liked it too. So when Ray Svensson was visiting one day, he brought Ray over to my cubicle to show him that I had done this curriculum architecture design. And 
Ray liked it a lot. And, and Bill Wiggenhorn even suggested that Ray hire my wife at the time. And so she joined Ray in January of 1982. And in the summer, they came to me and said, we did this project for Exxon Exploration, geologists and geophysicists. We've done the analysis. It's very much a Rumler approach, just like Guy, you do them. And we'd like you to design our curriculum architecture for us. So take a couple of weekends and do this for us. So I did that over a couple of weekends. The thing was a big hit with their client. And later on in, uh, in October, they decided that they were going to expand and hire somebody to do instructional systems design and a secretary administrative type. And I, I heard this from her at home one evening and I said, well, I want that job. And she said, oh, I already told Ray that you wouldn't take it because you're working on all these projects with Gary Rumler. And while that was true and I really thought, you know, oh, I don't, I, hate leaving these projects with Rumler because he was so inspirationally taught. I learned so much from him. I was having trouble with my new boss. I was no longer skip level reporting to, but the guy who decided to take my idea and call it the kit, the do it yourself, Gary Rumler consulting kit. He was in Phoenix. I was in Chicago and he was a micromanager and I didn't appreciate any of that. And so I was dissatisfied. I'd even asked to be reassigned and that didn't happen. So when this opportunity came up, I jumped on it. And I became the practice leader for ISD at this small consulting firm. There were five of us in total to start with. And it was only months and months later that I found out from Ray that the, 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 the thing about curriculum architecture, it was just a concept. No one had ever done one. I had done the first one, according to him, and and that's why he wanted to hire me so that I could do these things for his clients because he was doing a lot of strategic planning for training organizations, and then they had to go do a demo project or two, and then we were often involved in training our clients' staff on how to do these kinds of things. Anyway, so that's how I fell into the whole thing. That's my story about Motorola. That's my story about Rumler. That's my story about curriculum architecture. But then you ask about Six Sigma. So the roots of Six Sigma are many and varied. In fact, Bill Smith, the engineer at Motorola, who's credited with this, I interviewed him back in 1981 about one of my projects for the, the, these manufacturing supervisors. In fact, the, what he gave me of what people should learn, I had built into that first curriculum architecture. Um, and um, so, but so the the Motorola created Six Sigma uh, in I think 1986, and they licensed Gary Rumler's intellectual property when they created it. Now, instead of using something like Addy, which you know, for your audience if they don't understand that, that's analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation, and the people at NSPI, which is now ISPI, used that framework for instructional interventions and non-instructional interventions. So it was never at NSPI, and I never thought of it as unique to instruction. No, it was for anything. If you were gonna redo the process, you would use that. If you were gonna create new uh, tools, software, you were gonna use that kind of a process. Of course, you know, IT has their own models for all of that. And when engineers, created the process, took Gary Rumler's stuff and create and framed it, that process orientation, they called it DMAIC. And the C at the end of DMAIC stands for control. And uh, my friend Alex Salas, who interviewed Bob Branson from the University of Florida, or from Florida State University about, you know, the roots of Addy and where did it come from? Uh, he uncovered the fact that early initially, the E in ev evaluation in Addy was really evaluation and control. And then it was shortened to evaluation. Well, engineers are all about control and evaluation is a means to control, but it's really about control. So DMAIC reflects really an Addy-like model with control as the important. Now, uh, a woman, Karen Brethauer, wrote this paper about uh, behavioral maintenance. And that's one of the missing pieces when you were, were changing people's behaviors. 
um, in that we need to do maintenance because it'll dissipate. People, you know, you'll backslide to the way you used to do things if you're not, if it's not reinforced. So this maintenance of behavior is equivalent to control in Demaic or control in the original version of Addy, which was evaluation and control at the end. Anyway, so, so what I learned from Rumler, it was kind of was funny because he didn't do Six Sigma, which is variability reduction. His thing at Motorola, what he was doing with my clients and after I left, he was doing streamlining of processes, shortening cycle times. He'd take a process that was 88 days and make it eight days. He would take processes that were 28 days and make them you know, eight hours. Um, and one of the things that, that they learned at Motorola was that when you reduce cycle time of a process, and there's many ways to go about doing that, taking out unnecessary steps, having you know one desk, so to speak, do eight tasks instead of it going to eight different desks and all the, you know, sits in an in basket and then it gets handled and then it gets passed on and blah, blah, blah. So they were doing all of these kinds of things and reducing cycle time, which the Motorola clients really liked. Um, but you strip out costs. Not only do you reduce cycle time, but you reduce costs. And when you reduce the number of handoffs, you'll improve quality because there'll be less mistakes because one person understands the whole story to do the eight steps or whatever, instead of eight different people figuring it out. Okay, now what's this? And thinking about it and making some assumptions that turned out to be maybe not right. And so there's, you know, rework that's all included in all that stuff. And so that was, that's my story about Rumler. And I think he's a process oriented guy and he was doing what later became known as lean, um, which of course comes from Japan and the Toyota production system and all of that. But, you know, people are working in parallel with these kinds of thinking. Um, and, but that was very impactful to me. So all that stuff I learned and, Motor and Gary Rummler was also helping us at Motoro create a design process. So an instructional design process, what are the steps? What are, He used swim lane maps back in 1981. So it wasn't something that came out when the uh, uh, his book with uh, uh, Alan Braish, um, Improving- the white space. Yeah, the, and the white space. So in the, in the white space con concept, the language of the white space, uh, Alan Ramis tells this story in the uh, Gary Rumler tribute video from 2009 after Rumler had passed away and they had a bunch of people come in and work with Rumler and talked about these things. And Alan told the story of where the white space phrase came from. It was at Motorola. Um, but because, you know, Gary's thing was, you know, organizational mapping, you've got these silos. Well, here's the process. It goes bing, 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 like a pinball machine. And, you know, no one seems to understand that 13 steps later, nobody knows what happened before. They don't know where it came from and all this. It's just, everybody's working in isolation. And so one of his things was to streamline processes, make processes visible from end to end. And, you know, the concept of process owners came out that so that people would be actually managing this process. We don't care whose function it went from sales to marketing to finance. We don't care. This is, it's the process that's king, not you silos. And so we're going to manage the processes and make them more effective and make them efficient um, and improve quality, uh, quantity, time, cost, and all those kinds of things here. And that was the, you know, the focus of, of all of that experience. I could go awesome. on. <laughs> no, 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 this is good stuff. So one of the, my first thought is, so hearing you speak about reduction of cycle time, reduction of cost, uh, reduction of variation, uh, increasing controls, uh, uh, defining the process and uh, having a, you know, you didn't use this term, but having a profound appreciation of the system, communications across silos. Uh, the, the, it's, it's as if we have nothing to do with the vast majority of the conversations that you hear in the marketplace today about instructional design, instructional systems design. Uh, True. It's as if, uh, and so, you know, the, the, 
for our audience, the business terms that you, that Guy is talking about right now is absolutely essential to be able to add value to your organization and show that you're adding the value. Uh, if you don't know how long it takes to get something done and you have no baseline, you have no idea whether or not whatever the intervention is, is going to actually improve the performance. And so these terms that guys throwing out, if you don't know what any of them are, I encourage you to look them up. I encourage you to master the terminology of business. Uh, it is no longer a luxury. And it is, so this has been this has been true forever because um, I've heard at NSPI conferences back in the 80s, you know, I went to my first 31 out of 33 conferences up until 2012. And, you know, a lot of the gurus would talk like, you know, you need to understand your customer. You need to understand that. And you learn that, as Joe Harless would say, through front end analysis. You need to do the analysis. Well, analysis. most people's practices of analysis and structural analysis or otherwise are poor or non-existent. And that led to analysis paralysis. So this manufacturing group, this 30 manufacturing operations managers that I worked for the first time that they gave me a project, I attended their meeting, they had all get together every month, you know, fly to wherever one of the facilities and I'm there and they tell me, okay, this is what we want you to do, guy. And I said, okay, I did my best active listening, repeating what they had told me so that they knew that I heard them. And they said, okay, now, so what I'm gonna do in analysis. And the head guy said, stop. We hate, we hate when you people come back 90 days later and tell us what we told you on day one. Now he was pretty sure that that you know, I was going to go off and spend 90 days doing analysis and bring back nothing more than they already knew, and it would be a waste of time. And you know, so obviously, you know, my predecessors in instructional design, instructional system design, had you know left a bad taste in their mouth, and they knew all about analysis paralysis and all this stuff. So I, I've done this m multiple times in my career here, where I said, okay, so. Give me, I went to a flip chart, you know, this is before whiteboards, and I went to the flip chart, and I started, I created a bunch of columns, and I said, okay, tell me about, you know, this job, who are the job titles, write that down, post it, um, what are the, uh, uh, what's the work that they do, and I use a framing device that I now call areas of performance, but it could have been called accomplishments, major, major duties, key results areas, it's a chunking device, just like Addy is a chunk out you know, series of task sets and outputs. And so I would did that with them and that was, they were fine with that. And that was good that I did that with them. So they owned it. And then I said, so tell me about the outputs that are producing these things. And they gave me some, I said, so how do you, how do you measure these outputs? What are the tasks? Well, then they got 30 people in a room talk, you know, one person can't give you a task. They got all tangled up in tasks on the very first output. Uh, stepping all over each other, correcting each other. You know, we had basically a heated agreement um, <laughs> because that's when they all decide, oh, you, by the word the, you meant the? Yeah, okay, so, okay, ah, oh, we're good now, guy, never mind. And uh, so I've experienced a lot of this stuff, and this goes back to this communication stuff that I've learned from Hathaway. You know, basic things are giving information, seeking information, and then these next couple are very important testing, understanding, and then summarizing. And summarizing and testing at, uh, uh, understanding are active listening techniques to make sure that I heard you, you said this, and now I can paraphrase it and test it even further. So, so that would mean this then, and in this situation it would mean this other thing, and so that you can say yes or no to that or correct me. But anyway, so what, what my clients discovered is that they didn't know a lot of the answers to the tasks. They knew there was a task there, but they couldn't tell me much about it. And I said, well, that's what I got to uncover in analysis. This is, this is what I'm going to go do when I go do this analysis. So they begrudgingly let me go do that. And I made sure I didn't spend 90 days. I think I did it in 30 days, but I'm not sure it was a long time ago. And uh, I came back to them at their, in one of their monthly meetings. And I remember presenting my analysis data and I, 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 this was, I know this is a, a sharp memory. 
of course, we know how memories work. But I was in Toronto at one of the m manufacturing facilities, and my boss's boss, you know, the skip level, I reported Bill Wiggenhorn, he was in the audience. All the training leaders were there from that facility. They were all standing, sitting in the front row. I'm up at the podium. My, my audience, my 30 manufacturing managers are all in the audience. And so I started reading out the analysis data. Well, all Hades broke loose. They went crazy jumping up and down and screaming and yelling and correcting each other. It was pandemonium. And I said, I, I got control of the meeting. I don't know what I said exactly that, but to get that. But I said, you know, I can't work with all 30 of you giving me direction. Because as you just saw, you're giving me conflicting directions among all 30 of you right now. I said, why don't you pick the meanest SOB amongst you and I'll work for that person? Well, my boss's boss, Bill Wiggenhorn, and all the training people, their jaws drop. But I knew my audience. They loved me for saying that because I didn't use SOB. I spelled it out. Um, set it out and uh they love me for that because and and you know it was well the funniest coolest thing about that was that they knew exactly who the meanest sob was and he stood up and they all went yeah Tim, mike mike his name was mike weiss and he was in franklin park illinois just down the road from the from the uh, motorola corporate uh, headquarters and he said to them I'll take care of this. I'll keep him on the straight and narrow path or something like that. And so I ended up working for him. And the next meeting, the next month, I'm standing up at the podium presenting, you know, where are we at? What are we doing? And all this stuff. And pandemonium breaks out. And he slowly rises up a chair. And he points a finger at everybody across the room and says, shut up. And they all <laughs> let God continue. This is good stuff. And so, you know, I, I learned something very valuable is that find a strong champion get aligned with them now you, you got to pick the right person luckily i had them pick the person which is i think an astute move uh who you should work for as the primary point person to take all of the customers and stakeholders and get it funneled down to one person who could make decisions and would stand by the decisions they have to have a little bit of you know persuasion power among their peers um and work for that person and they'll keep you on the straight and narrow path. They'll correct you when you're wrong. You know, that's, I think it was just a, a key thing. And so that was a, that was a combination of things that I had learned out of, you know, quality circles at Motorola and where were they done well and where were they not doing so well and team leaders and weak leaders and strong leaders and the communication stuff from Hathaway and all the quality tools and such. I mean, I, I didn't, I don't know a lot about the quality tools and techniques. I know kind of what they are and kind of what they do. And I know that if I need that, I go get myself some expert that knows that stuff. I try not to become master of all things. I wanted myself to focus on project planning. Project planning was really key to me. Then doing analysis and doing it well and doing it quickly. And then doing design and doing that quickly with high quality. Um, which is, you know, when you review your design and clients, you know, rip it to pieces, that's your signal about what you didn't quite get right. Um, and then going into development. And I haven't done development of any instructional content probably since the early 90s, maybe mid 90s at the latest. I hire that out. I bring in other folks to help me do that stuff. They were either on my staff until 2002 when I went solo um or i uh, you know but but so i just you know i i try to leverage the right resource and their expertise and engage that into the project which means it takes a tight project plan and knowing when people when things are going to happen and so in my i've almost been a consultant now for almost 40 years since uh, november of 82 and I like to do projects fixed fee instead of time and expense because time and expense tends to have scope creep and then the price creeps and then the clients are unhappy. They may be the ones telling you, yeah, let's do this, change that, let's do this. When the final price tag comes in and they blow their tops because they weren't expecting that. They weren't paying attention to that. So my preference has always been to do it fixed fee. That way I can fend off scope creep, which means you know, not to make them unhappy. I got to make sure that you know, the plan is robust to what we've got to do, 
what issues we may come across as we're doing uh, the project. Um, in order to assure that I've got, you know, a decent profit margin at the end of my project, I, I got to know how long it takes to do what. So I do a lot of detailed planning. And that's one of the things that I learned from uh, Ray Svensson in particular. He was the Bell Labs engineer. He had a method and a format for project plans and all that stuff. And so I just kind of adapted what he had been doing um, and kind of maybe made that on my own, but it's really sourced from him. But so I think that that was, I, so I've never missed a deadline. You know, when I was going to do analysis and design and development, whether it was an eight day course or a five day course or a two day course or a bunch of job aids, I would have, you know, gate review meetings scheduled with my client on the very first meeting we'd schedule the analysis review, the design review, the development review, et cetera, and schedule that and put that on everybody's calendar so that they would show up. We didn't have online meetings like this. We would, you know, show up physically to one room and sometimes people would conference call in or whatever, but that was not really satisfactory for, for them. Um, and, you know, I just knew how to estimate, you know, what's the touch time for doing this task and the series of tasks and how much cycle time should I allow for that touch time. So if I've got three days worth of touch time, maybe I should allow five day cycle time for that to happen in as I planned out my projects, as I priced my projects based on touch time, but I scheduled my projects based on, on, on cycle time. And you have to, you know, be able to think about all that stuff. And I learned that stuff from, you know, my client projects, because we work, you know, with my, with my business partner, uh, Bell, former Bell Labs engineer, we work with a lot of high tech companies and low tech companies, but manufacturing, engineering and manufacturing oriented. And so I learned a lot of things from the engineering and manufacturing worlds that actually made its way into my approach, the concepts that I have regarding instructional design, modular instructional design, just like in the manufacturing world, if you have a big system, it's made up of products, which are made up of sub-assemblies, which are made up of components, which basically are made up of raw goods. And so there's this explosion, like if you bought a swing set to put together for the kids, there's a parts list and it shows you how it all kind of, well, that's the bill of materials in the manufacturing world. And, and so you, so I think of instruction that way. It's an engineered product. Now I call everything that I do architectural because of that curriculum architecture, but I could have easily called it you know, curriculum or instructional or learning or learning experience engineering, but I've got the architectural thing, so I've kind of stuck with all of that. Uh, yeah, even the Gilbert book, uh, Engineering Human Competence that you referenced earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed by how, so for example, whenever I was at Lockheed Martin, uh, there was a tendency to both depending upon which part lightning rods is a good conversation to talk about uh, there was a tendency for people to uh, either eschew completely or uh, completely embrace human performance engineering and it was the first time that I got to work with where it was such a lightning rod of a concept because some people thought that it was complete garbage that there is no way that it could work. Uh, however, others uh, uh, were absolute proponents of it and and knew the efficacy of it. And and uh, they used the term engineering specifically within the engineering context to under to to show the 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 credibility and what was actually going in to designing this. Uh, very, very much akin to what classical instructional systems development, as you were saying earlier, or instructional system design uh, uh, talks about. And the other th 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 uh, thought that I had about the lightning rod was you were talking about the one SOB uh, <laughs> that helped you. And the, one of my mentors is a man named Rich Arnold, a former Coast Guard commander, a sailor sailor, you know, uh, uh, you know, whenever you think of like a, uh, uh, you know, uh, an old school sailing vessel captain, you think of somebody like this and so <coughs> bold, right? Just so strong and so bold and he'll just call things out. And some people 
absolutely love him, right? Can't I, I, I will be loyal to him till the day I die. Other people absolutely detest him. They can't have anything, you know, they, they don't want anything to do. And that's that lightning rod concept, uh, as you were talking about, that approach, that SOB in the room, uh, just wouldn't work within certain contexts, right? Oh, and, uh, yeah, the right. SOB has to have credibility. Right. And, you know, you can have credibility, but be kind of milk toast about it, quiet, not non-bold, you know. But this guy wasn't afraid to say anything to anybody. You know, if the CEO walked in and said something that was stupid, he would say, well, I'm sorry, sir, but that's stupid. Here's why, you know. But I mean, you so, but, but, you know, and, and people that are bold and, and overt uh, with their thinking and their feelings, they have to be good. Otherwise, they'll soon be destroyed by the rest of the organization, right? And that's, that's what you're really wanting is somebody who's got credibility with the organization. Now, it doesn't always take a a bold personality, somebody who calls it like it is, there's, you know, more tactful ways to deal with these kinds of things. But what you're searching for, and I guess I want to say this because I don't want people to mis, mis, uh, understand what I was suggesting here. You need to find somebody who's really got credibility across the board. And if he doesn't have it with certain constituencies, needs to be able to establish that credibility right then and there, wherever it's demanded. Um, okay. Because they are your guide. They're your you know, your shepherd, um, your Sherpa to take you on the journey and you do your instructional design thing, which, you know, I learned also that, you know, not to talk about things and use our jargon. You know, I, we do that at conferences and online and blah, blah, blah amongst ourselves, but you use your best bedside manager, manner and you talk in the language of your customers. So I was learning all of these manufacturing and engineering kind of terms and purchasing and materials. I mean, I, I, you know, I had to learn about MRP, material requirements planning, which then became MRP2, manufacturing requirements planning, which then later became ERP, ERP, enterprise requirements planning. And basically that's like saying, here's the bill of materials to run an enterprise. Here's all the people, all the people stuff, all the non-people stuff. Here's all the processes. Here's everything that we have to have and actually to run this thing. Now, if you were starting off greenfield with just a field and you had to put something in place you'd want to know what are all the things that i need and you know so how how many cubicles and desks do i need and how many welding machines do I, or whatever do i need and so that's what our job is as an instructional designer is to kind of figure all of that out in my view and what's the process we're trying to enable what do people already know or not know how do we give them the knowledge and skills that they need in a timely fashion? What's going to be reinforced by the job every day, all day long, or once a quarter, or once a year, which are the signals that, you know, they're not going to be able to commit things to memory. So we need to give them that guidance, that job aids, those performance support things, and make it accessible. You know, either it's laminated and put on the machine so they can look at it whenever they need to use it, which is how, you know, that was the cool technology back in the 80s was laminated job aids. Um, but now we've got smartphones and all this digital technology and computers all over. And some of this stuff is embedded in the machinery. So that becomes the electronic performance support systems that Gloria Gary talked about in the late 80s and early 90s. So the, all, all sorts of things have changed for us. And but our goal is still the same. We okay. want to help people perform. And my definition of performance competence is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And there are many different kinds of stakeholder. There's the downstream customer that gets your output as their input, and they are critical. But there's also regula regulatory people, you know, the regulators. Uh, so the federal, state, and local, and whatever lands that you work and operate in and sell to, they have regulations also. So you have to be cognizant of all of that. Um, there's the shareholders, you know, you can't meet the customer's requirements and meet the re regulator's requirements and go bankrupt because you're spending more than you can get for it. You know, maybe you shouldn't even be in that business. Um, so there's all sorts of ways, you know, this uh, uh, financial uh, literacy, business literacy, you, people need this to understand, you know, how does a business operate? What, how do you keep score? You know, how, you know, what's an income statement? What's a balance sheet? What's cash flow? What are these things here? Do instructional designers need to know that? Do they need to know about return on investment or return on net assets or 
ROE, which certainly isn't return on expectations unless those expectations are return on equity, which is a <laughs> financial metric from the 1920s. I'm sorry. Don't get into a room with your CFO. You finally get to the big table and you're talking about ROE, return on expectations. And this guy, uh, Dale's going to think that you are a knucklehead because ROE is return on equity. It's not return on expectations. I mean, if you can't, if you don't know what to measure, if you don't know what the process and outputs are, yeah, go after some intangible like return on expectations and see if you've hit the happiness index. But to me, that's the kiss of death. I don't want to be in that business. But there's certainly a lot of instructional designer types, learning experience designers that that are think, think about that. Now, that's the fault of their management. So okay. I don't want to disparage. I think would agree with you. Yeah. If managers aren't taking their people and saying, hey, here's I'm going to got to find a way, some way, a quick, efficient, effective way to teach you about the business that we're supporting here. And how score is kept here. I remember my clients at AT AT&T Network Systems, the old Western Electric Group, they had financial metrics that no one else in the world ever had. They had their own unique set. And people would come into the job of product manager. I was supporting product managers uh, from 86 to 94. People with their MBAs would come in here and get confused about how the financial metrics were because they were different than what they'd learned in their biz school. And as I remember I built an 11 by 17 uh, page job aid on all the financial metrics and how they all organized to come out to the final you know, scorecard dashboard kinds of things. But where do these numbers come from in the AT&T system? Because it was quite unique. Now it was, it was a regulated company. All the regulators have been looking at at and for a long, long time. They had created all this stuff. All the regulators learned to love it and like it or not. But this is how they kept score. And as the business world changed, they didn't change too much because regulators wouldn't allow it. And so they were kind of stuck with some old school things. Um but it was unique. And, and so walking into a situation like that, you know, there's a huge learning curve associated with the performance curve. If you're going to get good, you're going to have to learn a lot. You have to learn the language, the, uh, you know, just the processes, the organization structure, who does what, what things are shared. I mean, who does organization and job design in a company? You know, most of the time, I think it's happenstance and, you know, but basically local managers may uh, to have a role in it. HR looks at it and, you know, prices it out for compensation purposes and writes job descriptions and all the legalese kind of stuff. But it's not, there's no organization that necessarily does that. Now, I've been in companies where somebody did do that. And they took a a process and a performance, a quality TQM kind of look at how to design jobs that reflected the needs of the process and then what's the organization look like and where do we have where are some jobs because of the flow of work going through is going to vary you say seasonably in the winter we're going to have less in the summer we're going to have lots of work so how do we bring in the right number of body count and have the right amount of equipment for that body count to work on in order to meet the demands that fluctuate you know in maybe a predictable fashion and maybe even not a predictable fashion. So that's all engineered. We engin- we should be engineering jobs and things like that. Then training people come along and figure out, you know, what do we train them on? Well, before we figure out what we train them on, what are the recruiting and selection standards that we're hiring for? Because if we can avoid training people because we hire people that have that knowledge and skill already, then there's less to train on, reducing that cost. So when we look at, you know, how do we as instructional designers work with the rest of the world, whether it's in HR or not, there's these other things going on and people doing them and either they're doing them deliberately with, you know, high quality, et cetera, or it's just kind of happening. And maybe some of the problems that we're asked to address aren't really rooted in knowledge and skills of the target audience. It's in what Deming called the system and what Rundler called, you know, the system. They both talked about it a little bit differently, but pretty much the same is that it's the system. We shouldn't be looking at individual performers and training them to fix problems. The problems are probably rooted in something else. So one of the things I learned from Rundler 
was the first thing to look at, and this is how I approach my instructional analysis, is what's the process? Is there one? If there is one, are people adhering to it? Because he's learned that just because you got a process doesn't mean that people are following it. And then the next thing to look at are what is the consequence system? Are we, is the consequence system deliberately or more likely inadvertently designed to reinforce what we don't want? You know, do, do we inadvertently give, you know, the top performers more work than anybody else because we can trust them to get it done and they'll do a good job and they'll stay and work 80 hours a week and we burn them out and they leave. You know, we got high turnover. You know, is it because we're doing that or is there some other aspect of the job and the consequence system that's that's really not reinforcing what we want? It's reinforcing what we don't want. And it's out of control. It's not deliberate. It's not designed. And so as an instructional designer, you know, I, I don't re-engineer consequence systems and compensation systems and all that stuff. But I have to have in my methodology looking at performance, help my clients understand where addressing knowledge and skills is going to help and where it ain't going to do nothing but spend money and waste time and effort. And you're still going to have the problem. So that helps them figure out, ooh, who else do they need to get involved here to fix those kinds of issues? Do we need to re-engineer the process, re-engineer the tools, re-engineer the compensation system so we reduce turnover? Is it a mixture of things? Do we also need to, I had a client at uh, a bank, my client, I didn't find out the results of my project, but I did a curriculum architecture. They had three different sets of curricula because of all the mergers in the banking world. And, and they were maintaining three different sets of curricula. And so they brought me in to clean it all up, do a curriculum architecture design, make it one. Figure out, okay, when we're doing you know module A, we're gonna take this content here, tweak it, use it at then. This content here, oh, that's good. You know, that's well, good as is, we don't have to touch it. And take from the three curricula and build one set of curriculum. And then they, it, maintain it over time because regulations change and tools change and all that stuff. So there was going to be an amount of churn in it, but they, instead of spending their money three different ways to maintain three sets of content, they had to just maintain one. Well, one of the reasons we were doing this is because their turnover in the bank teller position was huge, very costly if you do the math. So Nine years after I did the project, he puts a thing on LinkedIn here in a recommendation that says we, that we reduced turnover by 30%. Now, I didn't even know that he had accomplished that through this, and they attributed it to we had cleaned up the training so that it was performance-based, performance-oriented, which to me is task and output-oriented versus topic, topic, topic. Because one of the things, and I discover this in almost every project I've done, I've done 76 curriculum architecture design projects as a consultant and the one at Motorola before that. But part of, I, I do I do target audience analysis. You know, who are they? Where are they? What do they know coming in the door because of education and experience? Then we do a performance analysis. Then we do a knowledge and skill analysis. Then my fourth part, this is important to me, is what content does my client already own that I can reuse either as is or after modification? because I believe in that manufacturing world of reuse of component parts and all that stuff saves cost and cycle time. So almost always when I look at what do my clients have in place, they have topic centric content that doesn't go the last mile to tell anybody how to apply it. We'll teach you all about active listening, but not practice it in terms of, you know, you're at the complaint window, which is different than in a sales call when people love the product and can't wait to get it from you versus a sales call where you got lots of competition that's got a lower price and maybe some better value. You know, those are different contexts for, you know, communications, active listing and all of that. And so, so most content is topic centric versus task and output centric. So when I did this thing with, with the bank, um, you know, that's what we took is that, well, that content would be good, but what's missing is the practice with feedback to develop skills and confidence and assurance that you can go back out to the job the next day or the next week and actually do it successfully. But, you know, that's usually takes more than one practice session. 
one of the things that you know I, I like to when I talk to my clients about this, I, I tr at the very beginning of the project before we even do the analysis, I'm I'm hammering them on, you know, how are we going to make sure this transfers? How are we going to make sure that people actually know how to do this? You know, when I do practice exercises, when I design them, I always do the pra I do the easy peasy practice with feedback so that everybody feels confident in doing it and nobody it doesn't freak anybody out. Then I do the one that's called difficult. Then I do the one that's called darn difficult. And then I do the last practice exercise that's from Hades, where all hell breaks loose. This is the worst situation you've ever been. Now, it can't be unreal. It's got to be real. But if you're going to take people and increase their confidence and capabilities, their competence, you're not going to do that by giving them, throwing them into the, you know, exercise from Hades. You know, you'll just swamp them. You'll scare them. They won't even come back to the next training session or they'll leave the e-learning module in the middle of it and, you know, won't come back. That's um, an excellent example of scaffolding. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I learned all of that stuff back in the early 80s. And, you know, I'm not formally educated in instructional design. I have a radio TV film degree, which is why I went to my first job because they were converting from, you know, 35 millimeter slide strips with audio tracks, which was cool technology at one point to video, you know, video will save the world as they say. Um, and uh, I didn't work in the video department. I worked in the content development portion where I wrote, did analysis and design and develop scripts and, uh, uh, ancillary materials, we call them job aids. At, Mo at, at that Wix Lumber, you know, we were going to do everything with job aids and performance support, you know, and our clients hated it. They hated the idea. We were just going to give out job aids. What? That's not what they were. They hated the idea. So we just went underground. We embedded all the job aids into the training session, made our clients happy, gave the people what they needed, which was guidance or support in the workflow, we didn't call it then back then, workflow, um, but we helped them have these job aids so that they could, it would support them in doing the work. Um, and, and sometimes you need to train people on the use of a job aid, depending on their prior knowledge and all of that stuff. And, you know, sometimes your audience needs that. And sometimes people in the audience, they don't need that because they've got a lot of more experience than others. And they can just take your job aid and use it. And they'll be just fine. They don't care about the rest of the training thing. So if they, uh, if they don't finish their module, but they got the job aid, that's okay by me. If people finished it because they thought, I don't know how to use this job. You know, if you've flown, you've, you've seen the pilot walking around underneath the underbelly of the aircraft before they take off. They got a checklist in hand. They're looking here and there and everywhere to make sure things are okay. We give them that checklist because we certainly don't want them to forget to look at a certain critical thing. Because after you do it all the time, you're on automatic pilot. And so, therefore, we don't want them. We want them to delivery, do that, check it off, sign it, do whatever we want them to do just to make sure that they actually do it all. Um, but, you know, on that point, those people were trained. Those people were trained on how to use that checklist. They just weren't given a checklist and said, here you go. But sometimes that's okay. And sometimes we yeah. need to design our training so that people can that don't need it can just take the guidance, the performance support. And other times people can get the background information and demonstrations and explanations and all that before they actually just take this out to the job and use it. Yeah, I concur completely. There is a guy named Atul Gawande, and uh, he wrote the book, The Checklist Manifesto. And in it, he cites how there were all of these problems associated with uh, patients were getting infected, uh, patients were actually getting like medical devices left inside of them uh, yep. during, you know, during this, uh, you know, after they were closed up they're you know, yep. where'd the scaffold go? <laughs> checklist, the checklist manifesto is the book you're talking about. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And uh, in that he talks about how the very first intervention that was proposed for these various performance discrepancies was more training for people that are like PH, you know, MDs for people that are MDs who have gone through literally years and years and years of training and had all of these training requirements already. And uh, so he made it very clear that, uh, and it took him a great deal of time and effort to change the mindset that, look, we already know what we need to do. Uh, we don't need more training. We just need to 
a, a checklist and we need to agree what that is. And so his whole book goes through the process of establishing what the checklist should be. And at the end of it, it has this really nice job aid, a checklist for checklists. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so there was uh, a guy at NSPI, Odin Westgard, uh, who uh, I, I published an article of his in one of my quarterly newsletters back in the 80s or 90s, I think in the 90s. And he wrote all about checklists. But checklists and job aids have been a thing for a long, long time. I mean, it goes beyond the U.S. military's use of this back in World War One and Two. This goes you know, way back in history. The prompts that we need. Sometimes we need to train people, but because of the forgetting curve, if the job doesn't reinforce that new knowledge, like I said earlier, all day long, every day, then it's subject to being forgotten. And therefore, we need to give people the reminders we need or we need to do the space learning. So it depends on, in my view, this is a phrase I, a, a phrasing that I just coined here within the last uh, six months. But does the performance context demand a memorized response? There's no time. It's an emergency. You, you got to do something with the patient here. You're the EMS. You know, the, you arrived in the ambulance and you got to do something here. There's no time to look anything up. You got to have that memorized, and or is it uh, the kind of does the performance context allow a reference response? No, hold on a second here. Let me look that up here on my phone or device or whatever, and then I can respond appropriately. And sometimes it's both ways. But if it's both ways, that means the worst case is it's demanded on right then in that moment, and so therefore it needs to be memorized. Well, if the job doesn't demand that from you all day long, every day, you're going to forget it. So therefore, we need to do space learning or what we used to call reinforced learning, um, reminding people about things, you know, forcing them to do recall, um, you know, or practice and get feedback. It's why the fire departments are out there, you know, in fake buildings fighting fires, because it's not like they've never done that before, but it's just that there's key aspects here that you might just forget in the heat of the moment. And therefore we need to reinforce that. And anybody who's been- cycle skills that have to be continually oh, yeah. kept sharp. I mean, yeah. you, you know, you practice driving here, you know, it's, but so there's a, there's a lot of instances in here where you just need to know and again, it's whether or not the performance context reinforces that adequately or not. And so we as instructional designers have to have a, so too much now, you know, with the advent of e-learning, which reduced costs tremendously, both for creation of content and for deploying or making it accessible, we got worse than we were before. We had problems in River City, you know, back in the uh, 80s and 90s and then in the late 90s with all the e-learning tools coming out and all that. People could just create content. So they no longer do performance analysis and knowledge and skill analysis. They take the topic that they were given. They do content analysis and scour the Internet, find it out. Now they got to figure out how to reduce this down to the two hour or 30 minute or whatever the, the number is that they've been given. And they have no way to logically look at the content and decide, does this really need to know? Because they don't understand the performance application and they can't draw the link and go, you know, you don't really need to know. You need to know A, to do the job, the tasks, but B, I don't maybe not. And C, definitely, you know, the history of or whatever it is, you know, we don't need that. We can't make a case for why we must include that. And if you're a minimalist, which I think people should be, the minimum amount of information and then giving a demonstration of how that all comes together in performance and then having people practice what you just showed them. So I like to do it info, demo, and apo. So, you know, just the minimum amount of information, you know, what does the law require? What are, what is a major concept here that you're trying to do? What are your three alternatives? Let's demonstrate that and see a video or watch somebody at the front of the room do that. And now let's go right into practicing that. Easy peasy, difficult, darn difficult. And now from Hades, because we need to really, and of course we might give them more demonstrations and information in between getting to Hades, but but we need to make sure that people are well prepared and have the confidence that they need to go back to the job. I remember learning from Neil Rackham about sales training and things like that. And they would teach specific kinds of techniques and all that stuff. It's the spin questioning thing, situation, problem, implications, needs, payoff. 
Well, the first time a salesperson goes out there and tries that and it doesn't work out smoothly for them, they revert back to what they did before. And I had Neil Rack a meeting with my manufacturing operations managers. These were a, a lovely bunch of guys. And there was like five or six of them in the room meeting with me. And I had Neil Rackham come in to talk about this uh, negotiations training we were going to do, be doing for purchasing. And, uh, you know, he's a British chap. He's got his three-piece tweed suit on. This is 1981. And uh, he's uh, he's he, he just, he's got a little goatee. And uh, they did not like him, I could tell. They did not like him. He's another one of these high-priced consultants coming in here. Tells us. So he's, so, so he's tell, telling them some things, and he could read their reaction. And he says, do any of you play golf? Just out of the blue. And they're, they're all going, oh, yeah, yeah. He goes, did anybody play tennis? And half of them did. He says, oh, have you ever had a lesson? And they all go, well, yeah, yeah, I've had lessons. And he goes, did they change your grip? Well, yeah. He goes, so how was your ball control after they changed your grip? Oh, it went everywhere. It went all, you know, they were, they, got all, they were into it. And he said, well, so what's the job of a coach in that situation? And they all got quiet. He goes, so the, the new behavior has resulting in poorer performance than before. With your poor grip, your inappropriate grip, you had some semblance of ball control. But with the new proper grip, the first thing that people are going to see is that they don't have that same control they had before, so they revert. So a coach's job is to focus on the behavior, on the tasks, and make sure that you're doing that right and forget about the results initially until that new grip and the results that you get once you gain ball control with it become self-reinforcing. Now, and he mentioned somebody at the time, and it would be the equivalent of, of more recently talking about Tiger Woods. Why does Tiger Woods have a, a swing coach? I mean, you know, he was at the top of the game at one point. Why does he have a swing coach? So he needs a swing coach because he's going to go from being unconsciously incompetent to consciously competent incompetent to consciously competent to unconsciously competent where you automated everything and now you don't even know that you've backslid in your grip right. or your stance or something and so coaching and one of the things that neil did at motorola is that um his thing at, with spin selling was to train coaches on spin selling so that they could coach their sales people he didn't have training for salespeople. Motorola forced him to do that because they just couldn't imagine sales managers being sales coaches out on sales calls and correcting guys' behavior and making sure the guy was following the spin methodology correctly. They just couldn't conceive of that. So it became a combination of coaching for the salespeople and coaching for the sales managers to be a coach. But so Neil won over my manufacturing operations managers because they loved him after that meeting because that made so much damn sense. And so the purchasing, so this was all going to go to, we we're going to train the purchasing people on negotiations, but we we're going to have to train your purchasing managers. So when they sit in on a negotiation, they could coach that person at a timely point, not in the middle of a, a of a live negotiation when you're trying to reduce, you know, your price, the price of a vendor to get your costs down. Um, but that's important. So in instructional design, we often need to do that too. We need to train people, learn them, um, uh, or give them the experience. But we've got to do something to maintain that behavior, to make sure that it transfers, to make sure that it's maintained over time, that there's no backsliding. And too often, I mean, I've only had a few clients that insisted on this. My Eli Lilly clients insisted that for every training package they put out, there was something for the managers. So the managers could set expectations before people went off the training. So that the, when they came back, the manager would give them something to do that the manager could either look at the final output or look at the process and the final output to judge whether or not Guy learned it adequately and came back here and can do this now. And so you're really establishing expectations with the managers as well. And that would help ensure transfer, which is a huge issue because most things actually don't transfer back to the job. It's not realistic in the first place or there's the reinforcement or there's really extinguishers out there 
that say, guy, I know you learned that in training, but we do it differently here. And then it's all for naught. You just wasted yeah. shareholder equity. I, I've worked with many customers where that exact situation has happened. Uh, my first instructional design job actually with uh, SAIC, uh, I got to go and we were taking a tour of the facility. And as we're taking a tour of the facility, they're pointing out, you know, this was at the uh, Center for Domestic Preparedness. Um, and in this particular course, the, the highlight, the, the, the highlight of the course was that they had, uh, you taught first responders how to suit up and go respond to a chemical, biological, nuclear, radiological, or explosive event. And so whenever you went to this event, there's, you know, radiation or, you know, poison that's in the room. And so you have to suit up exactly right or the, you know, the, the undesired consequence is deadly, right? Yeah. And so, uh, uh, so we're going through the facility and you would think that if anyone wanted to be on point, it would be absolutely curriculum. And so we were told uh, from several different stakeholders uh, on the journey, uh, our tour guide, in fact, was like, hey, is curriculum here? Anybody from curriculum here? And uh, uh, my, my associate and I, Brent, first, first, you know, first week on the job, we're, we raised our hands and he was like, hey, pay attention to this. You guys get this wrong. You know? <laughs> and then even then, they said, so go ahead. Oops. Right. And, uh, uh, and then they said, hey, is anybody from curriculum here? Uh, this is the way that we train it, but this is the way that we actually do it. And then it happened like three or four different times. It was like, oh, your book says this, but don't worry about that. This is what you actually need to know. And that's been a common refrain in many of the places that I have worked with. And, and, the, um, and what's really sad is the response from the curriculum team and, and the leadership for that, you know, within that environment was not, uh, oh, let me, let me go ahead and do whatever it takes in order to make sure that we're adding value to the organization. Their response was, how dare they say that about us in front of everyone? Uh, and then to, to go, you know, almost in a legal, in a, in a legal fashion, right, to, 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 to document that and to, you know, to write that up. And, uh, but that, happens, it, that happens all the time. I've had, uh, when I do my work, I like to use a facilitated group process with master performers and other subject matter experts. So what Gilbert called exemplars. I want a group of them. And I want to work with them to figure out, you know, what are the steps? What are the process? And they will say, well, we have a company process here, but we don't use it, guy, because it's garbage. If we did that, it would take us too long and we wouldn't be successful. So this is what we do instead. Now, I take that back to a project steering team that I've assembled so that they can make a business decision about what do we do? You know, maybe there's regulations that drive the first process and the second one violates them. And so we've got to do a communications with all these people about why, but maybe there's something in between, but it's a business decision that instructional designers shouldn't be sat at, uh, sat with to, you know, to figure out, you know, what do I do? Because that, what you just said, the, people don't do people. What you just said, where you were confronted with, so I, I, I was confronted with this time where, uh, so the, the Coast Guard bought the HC-144 Alpha Ocean Sentry, and they, they, it's from Spain. So all of the OEM material was written in Spanish. Did I tell you this before? Have I told you this? Okay. Uh, uh, so all the original material was written in Spanish. And so they brought the plane over, they put it, they put it in, and everyone's using it. Uh, but somebody had taken all the Spanish and just Google translated that to English, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then what you were having was one manufacturer would say that this piece of equipment worked like looked like A. Uh, the technical manual, which went through that translation process, said it worked like B. The instructor, the instructor pilots said, oh, don't listen to that. It works like C. Meanwhile, in the cockpit itself, on a plaque underneath that particular 
you know, IEDS, the, you know, the, uh, the device that would show the status of the different uh, levels and whatnot, uh, said, it works like D. Uh, <laughs> and so you had, to, you had to work with all of these different stakeholders. And the only way that we were actually able to, you talk about go into the Gemba, the, the only way that we were actually to able identify, to accurately identify exactly how it worked was to take it up in an airplane, was to take off with a video showing exactly what the actual indications were right. as a result of, the, of, of that particular performance. And only after empirical ver verification were we able to say, this is actually what's happening. Right. And, and uh, there was a great deal of unlearning that had to happen. Uh, across the board, across the board. But, That's why pilot but, testing your content is so critical. Now, when I do development, I do an alpha test and a beta test uh, to get ready for a pilot test, which is the full-blown, full destructive test of my content um, in as authentic a, an way that it's going to be delivered or deployed in the future or accessed. But so we don't, and Bob Mager used to harp on all of this here, the testing that was required. And he would give examples of, you know, uh, things that weren't tested out properly, like, you know, Chevrolet brought a car to the market in America and in South America, and they call their car Nova, which means no go. And so, you know, but, you know, who would have thought, you know, well, that's why we do these kinds of market testing. And in our instruction, we need to test it out. Now, when I do pilot testing, I ask my clients for two audiences. I want a group of master performers who have not been involved in the development of this content, because if they were involved with the development of the content, they love it, they think it's right and all that stuff, and they're not open to hearing about, you know, that it's missing something, it's not accurate, complete, or appropriate. And so I want other master performers to test my content, because they can tell me whether it's accurate, complete, and appropriate. Then I also need the typical target audience members so I can measure learning because those people can't tell me whether it's accurate, complete or appropriate, but I can, and, and I can't with the other group, I can't measure whether they learned anything going through that. So I always have to do, and I tell my clients, I want to do a full destructive test of this because we want to find everything that's wrong with it before we release it. And that's where you would have found out, you know, that, that what, what the process really is, is different than what you have in your instruction. But if your instruction is based on some standard operating procedures or some other official documents like that, rather than the real world, the real world may have made adaptations and whatever you put package in your instruction, there, there's gonna be an issue. It's not gonna transfer and you're gonna lose credibility as an organization when you produce something that's not quite right it's kind of close, but not really close enough, not for something that's dangerous, uh, critical, whether from a cost standpoint or a human life standpoint. Um, and so, you know, but we're just used to cranking out content, uh, you know, that's topic centric. We don't include in there the practice and feedback that's authentic enough to ensure transfer. Um, you know, we're opportunity rich as the joke goes, because we've got so many things that we can improve. So, but, but so the Our real, one, how, how do we get people to do a better job and having a positive impact on terminal performance back out in the job? How do we, you know, one of the things is, you know, I, so I, so you mentioned Gemba walks. So I was never comfortable that I could do interviews, observations, and read documents and understand things that I needed to at the nuance level. So since the very beginning of my career, back in 79, I started facilitating groups of master performers, the experts. I stopped calling them subject matter experts because at Motorola, I developed a purchasing course with the corporate subject purchasing subject matter expert. That's how it read on his business card. We went to pilot. It blew up in my face. It was all wrong. He confessed later on that he hadn't been out in the field for seven years. And so everything that we had was at least seven years old. And I, so I asked my, my clients for exemplars and they said exemplars. I said, yeah, you know, this is exemplar is, you know, the best. And they go, we don't like that word, guy. That's a $3 college word because they were manufacturing people. So they didn't like stuff like that. So I said, well, how about master performers? So I've been calling them master performers ever since because they accepted. Well, that's OK. I had to think about it. Um, but so, you know, talking with the language of your customers, getting the right input. Um, 
And while it's helpful for me as an instructional designer, as an analyst, to go look at the performance, the last thing I ever want to do is pretend like I understand it. Because I, I learned a, a new phrase uh, about a month ago. I can observe the workflow and understand what's overt. I can't, along in parallel with the workflow, there's a thought flow. I can't read people's minds. Now, if I ask them, what were you thinking when you were doing step three to four, you know, what were you thinking? They're going to give me an answer. But the research shows that it's not going to be right. Yeah, and, and so doing a learning how to do cognitive task analysis and tease out and test them what it is, because what the research shows is that an expert has automated most of what they know. And it's non-conscious. They can't recall it. You could, you know, in the old days, we used to say, Bob Mager, if you put a gun to their head, could they do it? Ah, you have a motivation issue, not a knowledge and a skill issue. Well, that's non-politically correct, but I'll say it here. So you, so you can't put a gun to the subject matter experts head and have them give you the accurate, complete, and full story of what they're thinking. And their egos are going to demand that they give you something because they can't go, I don't know. I'm an expert, but I don't know. No, they're going to tell you something and they're going to think that that's right and all that stuff, but it's probably not going to be right. So the research says that an expert will miss, and actually all of us, whether we're experts or not, will miss seven, up to 70% of what a novice needs because we will miss details of you know, what we're thinking, how we're making discriminations and decisions and, and how to decide, you know, what to do and what not to do. We, they can't easily tell us that. And so there's methodology out there. And I got all this from Dr. Richard E. Clark um, out of, from the University of Southern California. And so Dick Clark talks about this and he's got a methodology along with, uh, with one of his associates, Ken Yates, about cognitive task analysis. And there's several books out there that are good on this. But at one time about, oh, back in 2012, he told me there were over 100 ways to do cognitive task analysis and only a handful of them were any good. Um, most of them don't even do what they purport to do. Uh, so that's, that's a huge issue. And so when we're doing analysis beyond content analysis, when we're going from a topic centricity to a task and output centricity, you know, how do we figure out what the thought flow is to go in parallel with the workflow? It's really critical that we give people, you know, cause I think you, a lot of people go to training and they get trained on this stuff, but it doesn't quite work. They gotta, they gotta do some informal learning or social learning out there in the workplace to figure out how to actually do some of these things that were unclear. And they don't know whether or not the training was inadequate or not but usually it's because the training wasn't adequate. Now, most things, if it's not life-threatening or too costly, too high risk uh, or reward, then it's, it's probably okay. But if it's high risk, high reward, then that's insufficient. And we need to know how to do a better job of uncovering and teasing out all of the thinking that goes along with the you know, overt co uh, behaviors. What's all that covert stuff going on? And, and I think that, that all, and you, and you just because you get a bunch of experts together and they all agree on something and Dick Clark says they can get you at about 85%, well, you're going to have to test out to see where the holes remain and whether, you know, and you may not ever find them all, you may give them 85% and that may be good for, you know, 99% of the uh, uh, situations that people face. But then something could come along, one of those cases from Hades, and now all of a sudden you're not really prepared to do that. You don't know. And, you know, that's when learning on the job happens and they somebody actually figures it out unless they blow themselves up or, you know, let the poisonous gas into their suit because they didn't suit up properly. Gosh, it's, it's a challenge. But most people aren't working on high stake stuff anyway. We work on a lot of low stake stuff with mass appeal. It's all kind of left generic so that it's applicable to everyone and helpful to few. Um, and that's that I think is another issue here. We and that's I, again reflects back on management is how they do their intake of projects, how they assign and clarify what the output is. And we do too many things that are, you know, have all this face validity. Oh, yeah, everybody needs that active listening. Oh, yeah, everybody needs active listening. But if we don't teach people how to actually apply it in their job, 
it's going to be a wasted uh, expenditure, a squandering of shareholder equity. You're spending shareholders' equity in the firm, and now you've just blown it on a bunch of uh, instructional content on some instructional experiences that may not help anybody actually do the job better. Right. And why concur. are we doing that? Concur completely. And I, you know, earlier you had mentioned uh, not having a formal degree in instructional design or whatnot. And that brings me to the very best performance solutions that I've seen, the very best uh, performance, uh, you know, for example, one of my favorites is the Red Cross, and they had this wonderful interactive movie that taught you, you know, exactly, like you left knowing, you left the learning experience knowing exactly how to perform CPR, what the critical steps were, you had it drilled into you from multiple different perspectives. It was an unforgettable, emotionally compelling experience. Uh, uh, all of these things, you know, to quote Michael Allen, it was memorable, motivational, most motivational and meaningful, right? Uh, nary an instructional designer was a sign. Like you look at the credits, not one instructional designer, not one, you know, even performance technologist, right, as associated with the project. And so the whenever you look at these wonderful success stories what what was the fundamental skill set or the fundamental accomplishments for those people what they were they were they were making movies they were they were experienced storytellers that knew how to tell a compelling story and so i felt like uh you know to quote michael allen uh in his book uh designing successful e-learning the subtitle is Forget what you know about instructional design and go make something interesting, right? And so there's this, uh, we absolutely have to, I think that I think the, 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 the start, the foundation has to be the goal, right? What is the business trying to achieve? What, why, why do I need to do this? From there, you work back to the accomplishments, the things that they, the, the, the things that bring value. What are the processes that add value that change the form, fit, and function to the organization, right? And uh, if I, and so you add to that tools like DevOps and modern automation techniques. And uh, for example, it's you were talking about, you know, 90 days for an analysis project. Today, you you know, what, and you did it in a month. Today, you know, there's tools like Abby. I don't know if you've heard of this. So at the Association for Quality, I went to their uh, conference for Lean and Six Sigma uh, this last time, and at the software tool called Abby, uh, A B B Y Y. I, I don't remember how many Bs there are exactly, but A B B Y Y. I believe, but it's called Abby. And in there, they gave this presentation where they were able to automatically like instantly the second that they had the tool installed they were able to automatically track and know exactly what the process was and then they were able to show in real time and even you know press a play button and show how work flowed through the process and what do you know that little red line right there is where your constraints at well, why? What, what's going on? Did you, so you would normally have to ask five whys and go through this huge amount of analysis. You just do a couple of clicks. It brings up who your performers are. And they saw instantly, here's this one performer that's uh, performing very suboptimally. Everyone else is responding within the, within the, uh, the control, right? But here are three, but one in particular, and this one in particular by missing this one key step, uh, is costing us over, uh, I think it was $155,000 a year, uh, right? And so uh, to, to have individual responsibility to get down to the layer like that within moments, right? Like, like to, 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 everything I just described, to get down to that level of detail before was was nigh impossible. And if it if you were able to do it, it would take months and months and months of effort um, and so to be able to have uh, that at your fingertips and those kinds of data solutions at your finger, fingertips, it's something that that now more than ever with those kinds of solutions right there, 
we 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 have to we we, we can't be doing this stuff of uh, creating nonsensical non value add prep, you know didactic knowledge dumps that aren't actually helping improve behavior. Uh, yeah. It, it, no, it's true that, uh, you know, the, the one thing that's really changed, the only thing that's changed in my view uh, since I started in the business in 79 is the technology that enables us to do our work and to deploy or make accessible our outputs. And that's been evolving and changing. It'll continue to evolve and change. Uh, there'll be new tools in here, but our process, our goals of our processes are the same. How we do them will be affected by the technology that's available to us. And um, now everybody, you know, no one, it's not going to be an even playing field. You know, some companies are going to be the early adapters and there's the laggards and all of that. Um, but, but it shows the promise of, you know, but you got to, you know, it's all about the process or workflow or whatever, you know, there'll be new language in 10 years on what that right, is. Right, right, true. And, yeah. uh, you know, that just keeps on moving because some marketeer will say, well, we got to call it something other than workflow because that's getting stale by now and we want to be different and new, um, which makes it harder for new people coming in to learn the business because, you know, do we call it guidance like Rumler and Gilbert did in the 60s and 70s or job aids as Harless called it in the 70s and 80s, or electronic performance support systems, or uh, performance support, or workflow learn. I mean, can you imagine if you were brand new coming in and being confronted with all that language and trying to figure out, yeah. is that the same thing or is that all different? Well, well that brings us to the next, thing. right? That brings us to the next segue. For, for me, there is this level of abstraction that I try to use to both uh, there's beginner's mindset, right? That I try to use, you know, I've been doing uh, uh, specifically instructional system design within the professional business oriented context uh, for 11 years now. And, uh, but, you know, before that I was an English teacher, before that I was a sailor that was my my greatest achievement was in a moment of need teaching people how to use the uh, this particular complex system that I'd spent the past you know couple of years getting really good at, and uh, that that enabled us to stay out to sea and whatnot. And so, and even before that, back in high school, I shared my first quote unquote instructional design project with where my teacher had had said, "Hey, we need a we need a summer leadership school guidebook." And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, and so we were able to pull that and that was my first first instructional product that I actually saw people use in real life. And I didn't know about instructional design back then, but I knew I liked that. I knew I liked making the product and having people learn it and making the facility or the learn whatever the, the enterprise was better because of that experience. And uh, so you go back and you look at all of this. There's this beginner's mindset that I'm trying to have where wherever I'm approaching a situation, I don't I don't know what the solution might be. I don't know. Right. All I'm trying to do because, you know, different organizations, different industries, uh, you know, uh, you know, everything that we're talking about within the manufacturing context the Phoenix project and uh, the unicorn project and all of DevOps shows empirically. Uh, and the book Accelerate by Dr. Nicole Forsgren uh, shows empirically that all of these things apply and are embraced by software development, right? And so whenever I'm looking and, and uh, you know, IT operations, and so whenever I'm looking at the problem, I try to approach it with this beginner's mindset that I don't, you know, what can I do to abstract the problem as much as possible and get back to first principles. If I could understand exactly what the goal is, if I could understand whatever the, and so yes, the terminology, whatever the word is that I use for that. And how, you know, if, if I were to recommend te to teachers, because good teaching is good teaching, right? Whether or not I got the degree or not, right? <laughs> good, good performance is good performance. And so if I'm able to, you know, show up, 
and 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 show what I could do and put it up there, right? Uh, uh, I'm able to prove uh, through just the results, right? Like you prove, right? Uh, the, the I'm able to show the results, right? And if I'm able to do that, uh, you know, the quote, uh, uh, my my Dr. Paul Elliott, he says. A good uh, a, a, a high school grad. He says that Joe Harless said. So you know hearsay here, but but uh, you know Paul, Dr. Paul. They, they work together, so yeah, you would trust Paul. Concur, yeah. concur, concur completely. But I, I was able to work with him at Citizens Bank while we were developing a call center representative training and a number number of other contexts. But during that project, he told me that Joe Harless said a good. A, a, a high school student, fresh out of high school, uh, that with a good job aid will be able to outperform a PhD without one. So uh, if I know what I'm trying to achieve and I know the basics for that, and I have a good job aid that tells me exactly what I should be looking for as I'm going about that, I'll be able to outperform. Uh, yeah, and so that's the you know what how do how do we encourage new HPT, new human performance technologists, new instructional system designers to have that abstract, goals focused, accomplishment focused approach? Well, a couple things here. So you can teach them that. I think that's easier to do than teaching and affecting their leadership. Because their leadership, like my clients back at Wix back in 1979 and 80, they didn't like the idea of just job aids without training. So they had a mindset. So, But it's, it's more than just our leaders. It's our customers and their expectations. So, you know, we have to, and our, and our leaders are usually trying to please their customers, our collective customers, if you will, and other stakeholders. You know, how much money are we spending? The CFOs interested in that, you know, the CEOs wondering what are we doing about, you know, our future needs that haven't even hit us yet, but are coming right around the corner. So, you know, sometimes it's for current state operations, it's easier to look at what is the process, what are the outputs, what do people need to know to be able to do this? What needs to be memorized? What can be referenced? And so we can figure all that stuff out. Um, now, a lot of schools that teach instructional design, I'm guessing, because I don't really know, don't have that focus. They're teaching you how to design and they don't know what your context is gonna be. It's like the difference between education and enterprise learning. In enterprise learning, we generally, not always, but most of the time, we know what's that process, what are the outputs, what are the tasks, what are the knowledge and skills that are required. We can figure all that out. In the educational world, we know you need to new, use spreadsheets, but we're not really sure what you're going to be doing with them. So we can only go so far to teach you about spreadsheets, whereas in an enterprise learning, we can teach you these are our applications of that. Now, there's always going to be new things that come along, and maybe you'll be able to figure that out without any more instruction you know, and figure that out informally, socially, whatever. Um, but there's a limit to what education can do. And I think that too many people in the instructional design business come at this with a educational mindset because uh, we've all been educated. And so we weren't taught the specific applications. We were taught a skill, but not how to apply it in a real authentic job context because the education didn't know it. Now, they may have given us a couple practice exercises and maybe one or two of them it occasionally hit something that was authentic to the job that we got, you know, years later or months later. So there's, we're always at that limit, but, but, you know, Rumler was speaking about these things. I mean, he wrote a forward to a book in 1969 talking about how inf uh, instructional technologists needed to become performance technologists. And we needed to have that performance mindset. It wasn't about, you know, so I kind of object when I see that, you know, I love learning. And, uh, you know, because learning is not the objective. That's the means to the ends. What are the ends? Depending on your context, if it's education, it's to learn spreadsheets and learn how to do all sorts of things with spreadsheets. But if it's 
but maybe you can find out what the ends are really for that skill is the application to do something in finance or in engineering or wherever spreadsheets are used because they're used everywhere. Um, but so figuring that out. So we need leaders in L and D, LXD, T and D to help their people learn how to do better analysis on the front end. And I would say project planning before that, but let's just start with analysis and the various types of analysis and not get caught up in analysis paralysis. And, you know, I, I, I've got four types of analysis that I do and I, you know, I could subdivide those into more and flood my client with, I'm going to do this kind of analysis, that kind of analysis, follow this kind of analysis. Already they hate me. So I've seen, <laughs> I do analysis and I'm going to do it in three days and then I'm going to write it up and then I'm going to review it with you. And they go three days. Okay, that's that sounds pretty good. So, because I'm going to bring together your master performers, and I'm going to facilitate them, and I'm going to leverage what they already know and try to fill in the gaps. And then when I do design, I'll use the master performers and take it another level because I do analysis in all of my phases, not just in the analysis phase. But so we can teach people to do that. But getting the clients to accept that and to expect it because the clients. I think to a large extent, they're expecting education, not training. And, and now we're going to do learning experiences, but that could be more reflective of topic-centric educational kinds of things versus task and output-centric training. And so the learning experience, and, you know, I don't mind the name change because I'm, you know, robust to all that by now, 40 years in the business. But so we can do learning experiences, which we should have always been doing. We need to be performance centric first, human centric second, you know, the, who is the learner and we need to meet their needs, but their needs are to be able to perform. No kidding. And so how do we get them to be able to perform out on the job? No kidding. We better understand what out on the job looks like, feels like, under what conditions. Are you doing those tasks and producing those outputs on a bright, sunny day? How about if it's 115 degrees with no shade? How about if it's 20 degrees below zero and with the snow blowing and you, it's a whiteout situation? Are those the Hades context that we need to prepare people for? Because if we're going to be learner centric, we got to say, I always like to write learner with a, a small L and then slash capital P performer. Learners are performers. Let's not forget that the fact that they're performers and learning is a means to that end. Right. And it's because it's not all about learning. Even in a learning organization, it's not all about learning. It's about performance. And we need to be better at a, as a learning organization you know, open to failures, learning from failures, uh, uh, communicating our failures, not celebrating necessarily, but communicating them so people don't make that mistake again. Because if we can stop making mistakes over and over and over again in this quarter or that quarter of the organization, you know, we'll reduce our costs, our errors, our, you know, and, and so we need to have that kind of a mindset that we're open to learning, we're open to sharing, and all of that, creating a learning culture, which has got nothing to do with learning products and services, no courses, uh, not even resources. That's not what a learning organization is. Now, they may use it's those kinds of... more of a controlling help. organization. I'm sorry, that's more of a controlling organization, a la Senge, right? Like, uh, exactly. it's, it's, the, uh, it's the exact opposite. If I'm more focused on how long people were in my class, how long people were in that seat, whether or not they performed to my expectations within my class, whether or not they performed well on the job, yeah. yep. that is that you, you just turned yourself into a dictator that is totally and completely focused on becoming like this godlike, you know, sage power. on the stage. Yeah. It's sage on the stage, right? Drop it, the sage on the stage, drop it didactic knowledge bombs. Uh, but meanwhile, they go back and, uh, you know, my first experience with that was whenever uh, the instructor for my sonar technician A school, uh, he was like, well, I don't know what happens, but whenever you leave here and you go to your 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 boat, they tell us that you forget everything. <laughs> and while that's not necessarily true, to a large extent, I saw why. And I remember, like, I even, 
had my notebook that I had had, you know, I, I, I filled up, you know, within this particular context to go study, you had to go to the secret squirrel room. You know, you had to unlock the safe with your notebook, you know, and then you studied within that notebook. People had to be, you know, watching to make sure, right? And, and within this very, you know, secure environment, I wrote stories. I wrote like all these pictures and diagrams. I took all these various books, right? And this is like 19 years old, right? Back in the day, back of the day. And uh, take all these pictures and diagrams, over 150 pages of notes uh, for my Sonar Technician Submarine A school. And uh, I'll never forget when we had to shred them. Uh, when we had to take all those notes and shred them. I was like, are you sure that I have to shred this? Are you sure? Like, I can't, there's no way at all to get this, you know, or to, to make any good out of this. And uh, I mean, it was just filled with instructor stories and all of the different, you know, I had all of these diagrams and images and little cartoon drawings of, of different concepts and how sound operated at different wire levels and uh, see stories about how people uh, operate within certain performance contexts, um, all kinds of crazy stuff. And meanwhile, very few other people even had like a couple of pages within right. their notebook too. And so I saw very quickly uh, the variation, right? And and how uh, whenever most of my classmates were far more interested in getting drunk, uh, right? The, you were in the, the Navy, of course. Yeah. Totally, yeah. Uh, that's a job expectation. Uh, and, you know, uh, so at any rate, the bottom line is that there, I, 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 and then I go to the shack, I go to the sonar shack, and my first battle station's missile. Uh, apparently, I haven't told you the story yet, so I'll tell it now. My first battle station's missile, I show up to the sonar shack. And everyone uh, is on their is on the stacks, all right. And uh, uh, and I say, where do I sit? Adult me knows, hey, that's not good, right? The fact that you know someone on the team didn't know where they were supposed to go or exactly what they were supposed to do before the actual event, not good. Young me thought it was my fault, right? And uh, I'm like, where do I sit? And he said, sit there, nub. I look at this. Nub means non-useful body. <laughs> you know, you were in the Navy too. And uh, uh, so I had to got my warfare qualification pins. And so I look at this machine and I'm like, what is this thing? And uh, and they, apparently I said that out loud because my, you know, the same guy <laughs> says, it doesn't matter. It's useless like you are, you know? <laughs> uh, so I look at this thing and it's the AMPQR22. By golly, I'm going to be the best AMPQR22 alpha operator ever. And so I immediately start messing around with this thing and trying to make it work or whatnot. But, uh, you know, I wasn't even aware that that thing existed, right? So did did the A school prepare me for that performance context? Uh, well, very fortunately, go ahead. I'm sorry. So the A school can only take you so far because... They don't know exactly what ship you're going to work on and what equipment is going to be there because every ship has got, you know, some old and some new and some borrowed and blue, you know, equipment on it. And um, I, then your chief or the, your petty officer, you know, is supposed to be guiding you and doing that stuff. But that stuff hardly ever happens, you know, in an ideal sense. But that was how A schools are are you know structured they can only take you so far they don't know that specific context i mean i went to the journalism school print and broadcast journalism school at dinfos and with all branches of the service and some of the three letter acronym agencies in the government and uh so we were all given this base stuff and then you go off to your duty station and you don't they don't know what that's going to look like and what your job is really going to be and so that, you know, so that's, but that's difficult. So there's always going to be so, and, and it's true in enterprise too. We, there's so much variability out there that we can't pass. So we can take you so far, but this should be understood. We can take you this far. You're going to go back out to your assignment now, and then you're going to have to figure these things out. And now if we taught you 
learned, if we had taught you how to learn, if you had learned how to learn, which is the new buzz phrase, and actually that's been around for decades as well. Um, what, you know, so how do you go about doing that when you get out there and figuring out what is your assignment? Who are your people you're working with? Because sometimes you're not a lone ranger, you're part of the cavalry. And so who does what, who plays the bugle, who holds the flag, who shoots, who leads, where's the scout? You know, uh, you know who's following up in the rear with the gear? You know, so there's all these jobs. And so pe giving people a mental model so that they can figure that out when they go out there would be useful. But too often it's lacking because the people back at the A school or wherever don't know. They've been out there, but they were at a ship or two or three. But there's more than just three variations out there. And so that's what's so difficult. Oh, in yeah. Each, each organization. Each, these days, each hole is its own, you know, yeah. is its own, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, Environment. Uh, it, it, totally. And uh, it's its own intervention. It's its own. Um, uh, it, it, so the bottom line is that for, for one of the things that got me whenever I went to go work with Lockheed Martin, where our customer was the Navy, right? And so this yeah. is 20 years later. The thing that saved me while I was in the, the Navy was this thing of CD-ROMs, because nobody on board knew anything about, uh, about right. that particular system, because exactly. it was useless, <laughs> obviously, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I went and I studied, I went into, I, on my own initiative, in addition to regular ship's qualifications, I found these uh the submarine on board training library of the Soviet library and in there i found these three cd roms that were all about the bqr22 so i loaded up and it's total array handling i was on a q6 uh boomer uh sonar system and so um i'm in a ohio class submarine and i put in the the cd rom in the total array handling space and uh and i've took the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master level courses for the this system. And I'd be like, hey, guys, this thing's amazing. Did you know? Shut up. No. Couldn't get anyone to to listen to what the, the wonders of this system. And so uh, I'd go all over talking about what you could do with it. And uh, but no one was willing to listen until one night I show up. And what do you know? The main sonar system's down. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, there, it is impossible for it to work until we pull in at this particular juncture. Uh, unit two of the Q6 on our system took the analog data of the 944 spherical array hydrophones and translated that analog data into digital data, uh, converting the beam forms or whatnot. And and as it sh that that got populated, with the rest of the system. well, unit two was down, right? So all of the, the rest of the sonar system was useless at that point. And so I look at my baby. Well, I know that that's the reason that's there is because it gets its analog data directly from the spherical array. And uh, they hadn't even looked at it. Uh, so, I, you know, there, this is like hours, hours and hours of not having, you know, any sonar system whatsoever. And everyone's freaking out about it because you're blind under the water. And uh, so I put on my headphones and, Sonar Supervisor gains spherical array image rays bearing 314, classified surface contact by nature of sound. Hey, you have everyone's attention. And in the moment of need, you teach. I spent the next 24 hours teaching everyone about that. And that was uh, by far and away the thing that I loved the most about being in the Navy. Like that was the, that you know, learning the complex system, teaching it to somebody else in a moment of need. I love that. However, today what I'm seeing what if I had not? What if I had not studied those CD-ROMs, right? What if I did that to completely and totally on my own own initiative, right? What if I just sat there? Oh, oh I'm useless, right? You know, what if I just sat there, and and uh, uh, and and listened to and believed that that was the case, and I, you know, am very grateful for that. However, there is this. Uh, tragedy of the commons that i see happening where you know the a certain stakeholder believes that this training is you know the responsibility of of, of a particular entity well they've got it 
And then the other person says, well, no, uh, they've got it over there. And so you have two people, right, exactly. And then in between, the, uh, the people that actually are supposed to have it don't have it at all, right? And you go to the actual, like in this case, the actual boat, and you talk to these people, they're like, yeah, it's a, it's a hot mess. I don't know who's supposed to be taking care of that. Uh, and so there's not there's no individual responsibility for a mission critical system, and so how you know you know wh- how how you know within a vast context like you know the Navy hundreds of thousands of people uh, you know involved how do you uh, prevent the tragedy of the commons how do you like actually get all those stakeholders together and figure out. Well, uh, you know, it'd be easier if there weren't, you know, people and organizational politics involved with things like that. But yeah, it's in complex organizations with lots of moving parts, you know, computers and digital tools and such help us we can organize that better. We can make a list of all the things that people need to be qualified in, and then we can look and keep track on that. But, but if people are cheating at the local level going, yeah, check, 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 we're done here because we didn't think that was important and we're paying attention to something what we perceived as performance, that's the human element in there. So what are the safeguards? What's the backups? Uh, because that may have been deliberate or inadvertent human error, but there's going to be human error. So what systems do we have in place on those things that are, as you say, mission critical? There's a, that's a point of failure. Um, and Deming would have said, it's the system. You can't blame the individual sailor. You can't blame the, any of the other people there in the room. It's the system. 94%. Who's in control of that system? You know, is it the, the department head? Divi- you know, so who is, who is ultimately responsible and have they not been prepared? Have they not been given the right guidance so they could go through and do an inspection and see, you know, and ask the right questions at the right time? It's, you know, there's always going to be those kinds of situations here. And it's not, sometimes we learn by the failure, like the failure of your system here, where you stepped in and showed them, well, we can do it with this system here. Oh, we didn't even know that because we were so busy focused on what we thought was important and nobody had done the what if scenarios. What if this goes out? What if that goes out? What, you know, what do we do? That's the case from Hades. Well, what do we do? You know, do we surface? Sometimes we can do that, but there's other times where that would be a bad idea. Because we, we were on alert. We were, we, were, exactly. we, were, we were the ones that were specifically responsible for if uh, when called upon to launch nuclear we- weapons. Exactly. So right. you sometimes you just can't do that. Well, you just stay in the water, sit there, so that you don't <laughs> bump into anything because you don't know what's happening. <laughs> what did it look like? So there, there's all these, you know. I mean, my my ship used to. Uh, so I was on a helicopter carrier. <clears throat> Big anniversary just passed and is coming up here. The evacuation of Phnom Penh on the 20th of April, and then on the 29th, the evacuation of Saigon, um, and uh, our our ship, we were steaming off the coast of uh, Cambodia and at Vietnam uh, at the appropriate times, waiting to do these evacuations of the U.S. Embassy and all the personnel and yada, yada. And we're steaming in 16 mile squares, a ship on this side, a ship on that side, you can see them uh, on the horizons. And uh, our, sh- our ship had a tendency where the where the uh, electrical electric board, control board whatever the right term is now, I forget, uh, in the hangar deck would catch on fire and we'd lose ship's power. And people would go to after steering because, you know, the original steering it didn't work. So you go to after steering down in the stern of the boat and that didn't work very well. So we were just headed right into the coast of Vietnam with no power. Everything had shut off. So everybody's in mad scramble. You know, we're at the general quarters, which for you land lovers is battle stations. And, uh, you know, but the ship is hanging in and we've got X amount of time. I don't remember what it was here before we hit the shore, <laughs> which is not a good thing because, you know, Saigon is falling. And uh, so it's, you know, this world is a mess. But our ship used to catch on fire all the time. So uh, and, and before that happened, you know, as we were getting ready for the evacuation of Phnom Penh and Saigon, 
Um, I, I, our ship used to catch on fire all the time, and it freaked mm. me out. So yeah, there was a famous Especially video after the Forestal, right? Yeah. So there's this there's this film in the Navy about the U.S. Forestal and it catching on fire, and how there were three fire fighting parties. One was putting down foam because the fuel was on fire and was on the deck. Another was spraying water, washing the foam away, which meant the fuel reignited. And there was a, a ship nearby that was had a firefighting priority trying to spray all this down here. And it was a disaster. And I forget, you know, there was, I forget what the number of people died. But so I, so I was, I was journalist on board this ship. My job was to run CCTV closed circuit television system, 75 TVs around the ship. And, and so I used to show this program all the time. And mm -hmm. since I did a nightly newscast, people knew my face. So I couldn't go anywhere on the ship without catching hell about, if you show that movie again one more time here, we're going to come after you. And I go, you come after me because I'm showing that thing weekly. As yeah. long as our ship keeps on catching on fire and we lose power when we're out at sea, I'm showing that movie. Because Good on you. you people that fight the fire better know what the heck you're doing. And there's so I, I've been using this phrase my entire professional career. I've been burned, so I have learned. So I found the video on YouTube, uh, oh, maybe two, three years ago. And I watched the video of this, this fire, the same movie that I used to show all the time on the ship. And there's a phrase in there uh, that, that where I got that, you know, I've been, I've, I've been burned, so I have learned. And this was at the very end of the movie where the narrator says, he, he lists the number, he tells the number of people that died in that fire because it was a horrific fire and yeah. a, lot, a lot of people died and lots of tragedy and all this other stuff. But anyway, so yeah, there's, I mean, we can train people and prepare them. And we've got then rookies because the original firefighting parties, some of those were the people that were hurt. So other people step in and they didn't do enough cross training of people who's not got that job for general quarters who go up there and man and do the firefighting who don't know what they're doing. And that led to this huge disaster where the fire kept on going longer and, you know, jet aircraft are exploding on the deck and, you know, what yeah, it was a real big mess. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the issue is that we, how do we become robust to all the, you know, probable uh, situations and do we have to go into the, some of the improbable, you know, and that's, that takes time and money and most organizations aren't willing to do that. They're hardly willing to focus on performance and get the instruction to reflect what the authentic performance requirements are, let alone, you know, look at every, all the various, you know, situations that these, that the performance might be required. And what are all the, you know, situations from Hades that you might have to prepare people for. So we're limited. Um, hopefully, you know, we get lucky enough that we can quickly recover from those kinds of disasters, but yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And I think that, uh, I think that luck, you know, uh, it, it is definitely involved. Like what if I, you know, the, the fact that there, there was a system or that there was those CD-ROMs for instance, um, and even within, the, you know, you hear stories about how awesome World War II was and Battle of Battle of Midway, right? And whenever you hear the story and you go through it, it was complete and total luck that we found that that we found the Japanese fleet when we did, in the exact moment that we needed to, in order to have the right. It yeah. was luck, yeah. Uh, and it was it was providence, you know. Now we can prepare people to be lucky. We can't right. necessarily engineer the situation where they have an opportunity to be lucky or not. Um, but that's why we do drill and practice. You know, that's why we 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 should be doing those kinds of things here on the things that aren't routine. You know, it's the non-routine things that don't happen often enough to remind us that they could happen. And are we prepared for that? And it takes a lot of leadership um on a ship or elsewhere to decide what do we really need to be prepared for you know what is of some of our worst case scenarios and what would that mean to us and who would do what you know if the if the i used to joke that uh 
when I'm setting up people for practicing things like this, well, you need to be cross-trained on this because the company bus that took us to the company picnic, it rolled over and those people will be getting out of the hospital in two weeks. So you have to step in and do it. So what do you need? What do you need to do to get do that job here? You're not really, you know, this is not your job. How do you step in? And so when people need to be cross-trained, we need to figure out, you know, who are the logical, who's the, the second person and third person and fourth person to step in should a disaster really hit? You know, we need don't need to do that in everything. What are the cris- critical processes, the critical systems that need to be attended to um, in, a, in a disastrous situation? Is If the company headquarters caught on fire, what do we want people to really do, you know? grab the key computers and and run them out of the building or what? Or did we put things in the cloud? Oh, okay. So we built in technology to serve us um, so that we, you know, can survive those kinds of disasters. But, you know, that's that risk management kind of an attitude and understanding how do we mitigate risks and what risks can't we mitigate totally? And so then what do we do? What's our plans? And that you know, people just aren't into planning. We're we're running on short cycles. We're driven by, you know, short term measurements and expectations. And we're not we we don't often enough. You know, I'm overgeneralizing, I think, but I think it's generally true that we don't prepare um, for longer term needs. We have such a short mentality driven by many different factors and it's but it's certainly not got to do with our attention spans but but it's the expectations that are set by leadership and so a lot of this stuff reflects back on leaders managers who are leaders informal leaders in the organization you were an example of a leader in your sonar shack because you took the initiative and, you know, that's what, you know, that's when you're hiring people, you should be looking for people who take the initiative that don't need to be told every last thing to do. And they're going to figure things out locally and step up to that. And that's really hiring and selection system, not training system. We can if we find the right people and train them and teach them how to learn to learn and give them some frameworks and thought thinking processes so that they can go to wherever they're going to go and then figure out that last mile. How do we take what we've taught them and get that last mile to authentic performance in their context? Because there's too many of those out there. It's changing all the time. We at the A school don't know what other equipment they're putting in it all, you know, out there on the ships and the state on the uh, land-based duty stations. So we need to prepare people for that learning and figuring it out. So there's a part of this is going to be informal and social. You ask the chief, you ask the pay officer, you know, and they need to be taught not to be putting you down and running you through, you know, the, the, it's like the uh, going into a fraternity and being, you know, going, getting a, a, being a pledge and being mistreated and all that stuff. Cause that's just part of how we, you know, we need to figure out where we spend our time and what, and so it's up to leadership to make sure that in the middle, Those kinds of things are happening, that people are being attended to, that they're not being abused, that they're being seen as valuable human assets with skills and capabilities and need to be cross-trained to to pick it up. Because if in the heat of the battle, you may need Guy to step up and do EJ's job because EJ is lying over there in the corner and he won't be with us for a while. Um, you know, that's, those are the challenges for leadership. Same thing in the ISD, LND, LXD. Leaders have got to figure out how to manage the expectations of their customers to get a performance orientation, to really work on high priority, high risk, high reward, high stakes performance, and not all this low hanging fruit stuff. Because people can learn that informally and socially. We don't need to try to make formal content for that. And figure out what those things are and work on the things that are critical to the business, the current state, the future state, the long-term future state, if that's uh, visible to the leaders. And then prepare their people to do better. And maybe we need specialists who can do analysis and specialists who can do design and specialists for all the development tools that we have, rather than expect people to be generalists and learn all of that, because they're not going to get be as good as they could be if they were a specialist. Um, and yeah, so that, that a, conquer they approach. They call that, Pardon? instead of I-shaped, like where there's a specialist, they call it T-shaped, where you have a broad awareness of and can, or somewhat, at least somewhat 
proficient at uh, a broad array of skills, right. but you have your area of expertise in one. Yeah, you need to know what's going on upstream and downstream from you to, for you to play your roles and understand the quality, what might be missing from what you're getting from upstream as you do your thing. And you need to know what the requirements are downstream and for order for you to do your thing. But if everybody is a generalist, and I think that this is an issue, it's, it's impossible to be a generalist here. There's too many development tools, if you will. And there's too many, you know, how, do we expect the, the designer to be, you know, the, the data expert as well? You know, so the, we need more role clarification and pre preparation and cross-training. And it gives us a chance to grow people from developers to designers to analysts to project planners and managers. That's how I used to do it in my firm with my staff. I'd bring people in as a developer. If they were good at that, they'd be have been working with somebody's design. They'd now learn how to do the design. Then they'd learn how to do the analysis to feed that design effort. But they needed to understand the whole process and where it all comes from. and what was expected from them? Because we, when we fragment things like analysis, design, and development, too many people think of it as a waterfall approach, and it's not. Mm -hmm. I do analysis when I'm doing project planning and kicking off projects. I'm doing analysis in the analysis phase. I'm doing more analysis in the design phase, and I'm doing the analysis when I'm doing development. And then when I go pilot test stuff, well, it's like, formative and summative evaluation, it's formative and summative analysis. I'm figuring out what didn't work as well as it needed to and what do we need to fix? And then right. of course, once you release your content, there's continuous improvement driven by changes in the real world that that put your make your stuff go out of date or inappropriate for some reason. And so there's always this meeting. So our, you know, most leaders don't have the systems and things in place so that they can manage all of this stuff as a complex system, you know, because learning and development, learning experience design is more than some Addy like or Sam like or whatever set of processes to produce content. Um, there's much more to it than that. And I don't think that many leaders have a good framework and have a handle on their own processes. Most processes are unnamed. Uh, they're informal, they're unnamed and unmanaged. And and we are yet, if we're supposed to be process oriented and helping people learn the processes, we're dealing constantly with the fact that, well, some people call it this and some people call it that, and it's on the two different coasts. It's the same thing, but we have different language for things because our processes are for the most part informal. Um, and everybody's got a name for them locally, but that doesn't translate across the various uh, entities where we do our work. And 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 not only the not not only the informal, but they if they're they're not truly known because they can't be measured, right? Uh, yeah, there. Well, and there's a lot of things that we don't bother measuring. We're okay with it being informal, but it may be low stakes. So we don't have to pay attention to everything. We just need to figure out in our context, what are the high stakes processes with high stakes outputs? And maybe those stakes aren't for us, they're for downstream. 14 steps later, you know, that's where the that's where it really becomes critical. We need to have that, what was called at Motorola, line of sight from the beginning of the process to the end of the process, through all the silos, through all the handoffs. Yeah, you call that uh, a value and stream and and uh, exactly. Lean, Lean exactly. Six Sigma speak, and you know having that value stream thinking. Uh, so there, there. It's funny how you were talking about reduction of waste in many different contexts. Uh, the acronym downtime, right? Uh, for, for for identifying all the different waste and whatnot, as part of doing a gimbal walk, right? Uh, and as part of understanding and looking at how. Uh, so whenever you map out the value stream and you have that line of sight that you're talking about, whenever I map out my current state, even for one particular value stream, they say uh, there's a woman named Karen Martin uh, who wrote a book called Value Stream Mac being, and uh, one of her other books is a book called Clarity. Uh, and there's a whole lot of others that she likes. Uh, oh, and metrics-based process mapping, which is, so value stream mapping is the uh, the very strategic 
bird's eye view, right? Where senior leaders get together and they say, okay, well, here's my here's my entire value stream across all the different various work silos. But what about my tactical view where I'm in a particular work center in, in a silo, how do I measure out my processes there? And so metrics-based process mapping uh, is this just an Excel spreadsheet where you're able to go through and you're type in the values for how long it took, you know, what what are my cycle types for these particular, you know, what's my touch time, right? And so whenever I have, uh, you know, whenever I map this out, I'm able to identify very quickly, this is what my metric, you know, this is what my baseline is, right? And and you apply that to Lean, Lean Six Sigma for service, uh, suddenly, it becomes a very you know invaluable tool for our people in our profession uh, uh, because that enables us to not only uh, determine because as Goldrad says we've talked about this before as Goldrad says any performance improvement that's made above or behind that, that's made before or behind uh, before or after the constraint is an illusion right so. I have to identify my constraints. And, and uh, if I'm able to identify the constraint, then I'm able to exploit them and widen them as necessary. But how, what, what do I mean by necessary? Because, you know, to, you know, Kanban th thinking slash, you know, uh, again, waste is that if I improve the constraint here, but then what, where's my next one, right? Exactly. So if you begin at the end and work backwards on constraints, so people should read the goal, which is what we're talking about, the uh, okay. one of the old rats books. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so, uh, but we can't expect, you know, so there's, so this is a complex thing, this instructional design business where we're helping our clients and especially if we're looking to help them beyond instruction to help them identify their own issues. But um, so I, I always thought of the artistic, rendering of a building of a campus and then the next set of blueprints underneath that go into deeper and deeper and deeper until you eventually find the electrical wiring diagrams in there right and another thing was the plumbing and it all, so we need to have that kind of an idea here when we're looking at our clients processes um what i what was always key to me was to helping my clients understand what their performance issues were, where the current state gaps were, what were some of the probable causes of those things, and some things that that training can't fix. Because I would always sell that. When I've had people say, well, you know, then why do you even need that? You know, you only need the knowledge and skills that people need to do the test. You don't need to know what the current state gaps are. I said, well, yes, I do, because master performers, by definition, have figured out what the barriers to performance are, and they've figured out ways around them. Or in the first place. And in the second place, if they were unavoidable, they know how to recover quickly. And so I want to find the gaps so that I can teach new people, maybe not right initially, first thing, but to prepare them for the practice apo from Hades, is that what are the barriers, because this is the fodder that I need to build those exercises, um, what are the barriers to performance how to recognize them or anticipate them, how to avoid them if you if you possibly can, and then what to do if they were unavoidable. Because some things are not in your control and you just get lucky or unlucky and you're gonna deal with those things. Have we prepared people for something that's not quite as easy as A, B, C, one, two, three, which is maybe what we taught them, but then there's all these barriers that are there, all these landmines, ocean mines, for you sonar uh, sailors from in submarines. But um, so how do we teach people to avoid these kinds of things? And that requires them anticipating them. So it's not the first thing you learn, but at some point you better learn that. We better have some, that's why I like instructional systems design over instructional design. I need to look at instruction as a set of systems of a set of instructions training, education, communications, job aids, that whole thing, depending on the, what the target audience needs, what level of content they need. Do I need to create an awareness because of what they already know and that's sufficient? Or do I need them to have skills practice and then practicing it in authentic application? So it's all over the map here, but I need to look at the system of how I'm gonna grow people. And when they come in the door, 
they're not all homogeneous. They're not all have the same knowledge and skills coming in. So how do I make the front end more modular so people can get what they need? Because just because some people have the same job title doesn't mean they have the same job assignment. You didn't have this. You had the same rating in the Navy, but you had a different context that you were going to with different equipment, different expectations, and different people around you who either knew things or didn't know things. Another guy that came out of your school may have gone to another sonar shack, and they knew what that piece of equipment was, and they were fine, and they already knew that. In your case, they didn't. So that all that variation is just, is just part of the challenges of, you know, what we who help people learn how to do their jobs better. Um, we need to have our own ways of doing that work. And so we are opportunity rich in that as a field, as a profession, we have a long way to go in order to reach some state of nirvana, heaven on earth. Right, right. And uh, I, saw, I was, was listening to this awesome DevOps uh, podcast uh, yesterday, and it's said that, uh, Will we ever reach DevOps nirvana? No, uh, it will always be hard. However, we get to choose the kind of hard that we that we get to that we get to have. And uh, even for like uh, working with the Coast Guard again, uh, one of my mentor, one of my first instructional systems design mentor was a guy named Dr. Uh, Alan Martinez, uh, who. Uh, just taught, uh, he got his PhD in human capital management uh, as taught by Jack Phillips. Uh, and he was saying, um, first, one of the biggest lessons I learned from him was in the end, at, at the end of the day, it's all about relationships. And uh, if uh, the next one was, uh, if I want to uh, if I want to be effective, I need to add value. And if I want to change the culture, I need to be extremely patient. It took him 20 years, 20 years of working both as a Coast Guard pilot, one of the crew. He went after and got his master's in instructional systems design development at the University of South Alabama as part of a partnering agreement that the Coast Guard had with, with them. Uh, which was very fortunate because there was a human performance technology mindset that I was taught in South Alabama. I, I you know, and I now believe that that's specifically because of the relationship that they had with the Coast Guard. Um, yeah. and, you know, or at least it's highly plausible that that's uh, that that's one of the th one of the progenitors, one of the reasons for that. And so, whatever uh, I am, you know, approaching things from that perspective. He, he, it helps me to have the long view, right? Because it took him 20 years of being a pilot, going through that whole process, going through uh, working as a contractor for years, working as a, a, a government, you know, as a GS, uh, you know, government service. And whenever he was finally successful, uh, there was all of these pushbacks and, you know, but finally, people got it, and it wasn't just that one organization, that one branch. The whole base understood. Oh, this is what the role of performance support is for our organization. This is what we're doing here. Uh, this is what performance technology is, and this is how you contrib contribute and be be part of that. But like I said, twenty years, and they wanted it. They, they they were they had executives you know the the CEOs for many different times I I, I remember my first time uh, meeting one of the CEOs on the base and I was telling him my story about the BQR twenty two and he says uh, oh you're a believer you know <laughs> and so he uh, you know it took me a while to figure out why he would even say that and it was because he was dealing with all of these people that that were not believers in the efficacy of, of that. Um, and so I find it very interesting that an organization where they have that deep relationship with ISPI, where they have that deep relationship with all of these people that were telling them, hey, here's the things where, that they need to do, it still took 20 years of sustained and focused effort, you know, showing up day by day in order to change that culture. 
Uh, I, I think that's that's I think that's true. It's uh, good ideas. Uh, I've heard this uh, many times over the past decades, but you know, a great idea takes twenty years to really get uh, to be effective to have an effect. And uh, you know, I you said something earlier about uh, you know that it's all about relationships. Well, I think it is partially about relationships, but it's not all about relationships. Uh, the only universal truth I've I've uncovered is that there are none. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm going to have to be uh, watch my time here. But uh, oh. so we had you asked me a question uh, in preparation for this about you know, what kind of guidance or what I would suggest to new people. So I dragged yeah. out this. This is from 1985 from the Chicago chapter of NSPI, which of course is now ISPI. But this was uh, an article that uh, I wrote. Uh, this was a, a part of a series of a sounding off professionals trainer air their concerns. And I wrote that uh, my article on that about, uh, let's see, what was the exact title of it? It's consulting, subcontracting, and freelancing. And I wrote this in, in uh, I was triggered, which is the appropriate term. I was triggered by that newsletter's earlier article months earlier that said, you want to become a consultant? Come on in, the water's fine. And I was thinking, no, no, don't say that to people. They've got their their regular paycheck at stake here. They got their mortgages and their you know kids' education and all that stuff. Don't tell people that. Um, so I became a consultant in, in November of 1982, and I'd had many people at that local chapter in Chicago ask me about going out on my own. And I didn't really go out on my own. I joined a small consulting firm, which is very different here. But, oh, yeah. but so, so I started thinking about what this one article had suggested. And so I said, you know, there's a difference between consultants and subcontractors and freelancers. And I I made up the, the distinctions. And so people can, you know, take it, uh, not agree with all that stuff. And that's fine. But I talked about, you know, uh, for people that were going out on their own, uh, especially if they were going to set up their own shop and, and start selling themselves and their products and services and all that stuff. And I, cause I had a lot of people tell me when I'd ask them some questions and, and I'd say, so what are you going to sell? They said, well, I can do everything. Well, I said, well, that's really hard to market. That's a messy marketing message that you've got that you can do everything. Or are you just going to say I can do everything or are you going to list everything or, or what? So, so I had recommend, I've been recommending to people since the eighties to have some focus. If you can do everything, that's fine. Pick two, three, four things that you can do that you're going to promote and market that you can do. And if you get your foot in the door on that stuff, you can talk to your clients about other things after you've proven that you can actually do these limited number of things. Because you've got to figure out, so what are you selling specifically? And how are you pricing that? And then for each one of those things, who are your competitors? for the markets that you're targeting, for the customers that you're targeting, because they have options. They can hire you or other entities, other people. So if you'd use the, the, one of the quality tools, uh, QFD, Quality Function Deployment, House of Quality is what AT&T called it because they have to call it something different. So where, are, call it today. Yeah. So where are you, what are your features and benefits of what you're selling for A, B, C, or D? And with those features, you know, are they benefits? Do they have an advantage to your customers? Um, but for them, how do you stack up against the competition? Are you do you have an advantage in any one of those things? Do you have parity? You're just as good as they are, or you do have a disadvantage because that's going to impact how you market yourself and try to promote your advantages over any disadvantages that you have. But if you're a parity, at least you can say, Yeah, me too. But so it's not as easy as just going out on your own. It's a very competitive world. The thing has only gotten worse with the internet and people can find and, you know, they can find others that can do the same thing that you're selling and maybe they got a better price or maybe their price is the same or more, but they have much more experience. So how are you going to deal with that in a marketplace that is going to be competitive. And so some of the other things I wrote about is that, you know, you got to worry about your, your professional appearance and your demeanor. Well, appearance is less 
of an issue here since the days of the you know three piece suit and and uh, ties and all of that for men. Um, but you know, so we've kind of gone away. Point though. Yeah. But 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 so how you appear, you know, are you going to be the Rod Stewart hair look, you know, or or uh, or Boris Johnson in in the UK, you know? So what you know? So what what's and maybe you do want to do that. Um, I, I was talking with somebody the other day. They were saying back in the eighties and nineties, they had a ponytail. A guy had a ponytail, and all of his clients, bankers in New York, loved it because. He had the hairstyle, I guess they wanted, but they couldn't have. Um, but so you got to think about that. And how do you come off as a professional? You know, so uh, how do you demonstrate your commitment, your flexibility, your interpersonal skills, especially your communication skills, your written and your verbal communication skills? These are all things that I think that people need to assess about themselves to determine, are they ready for prime time to be out there in a competitive marketplace? So what are you selling? Are you prepared for, you know, do you have the right skill set? Do you need to polish up on your, you know, you can't, if your customer gives you a stupid idea, you can't call it stupid. Customer may have, not be right, but they are never wrong. It, well, uh, yeah, exactly. They're, you know, so, you know, and, and you know, I, I got, had an argument with, I got triggered by a client, General Dynamics, we were, ta you, we were talking about. Um, General Dynamics triggered me because one of my clients was going around saying this was in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. The customer is always king. The customer is king. The customer is always king. And I said, what if the customer wants you to do something that's against the law? Who's the king? Is it the government that's going to fine you and pay, make you clean all that stuff up and maybe throw some people in jail? Or is the customer king? So I ended up writing an article about stakeholders and a stakeholder hierarchy, because a lot of people are in situations where they have to make decisions, they get conflicting requirements. So who wins and who loses? And you know, dealing with the winner, that's easy enough, but how do you deal with the loser, the person whose requirements you're not going to meet? And how do you rationalize for them as best you can why they lost and somebody else won in the requirements when there's conflict? Because there's often conflict and so systems engineers would pull out their trade space charts. Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. There are ways to look at these things to figure out, you know, who. So, you know, it doesn't matter what the customers want if it's going to bankroll the shareholders. Right. So the shareholders win, the customers lose. But if the government says we don't care about you shareholders, we're going to throw everybody in jail and fine you and shut down your company here. So the government can actually win. And then if to honor Roger Kaufman, the late Roger Kaufman, he just passed away several months ago. Um, he talked about mega and doing things for societal value. So if you had social responsibility, you'd want to do things that are good for the planet and all the people on it. And you, know, you want to put the government in second place, even though they have this enforcement power. But so we want and, to. And, and on that point, Taguchi would agree with you. Uh, the Taguchi loss function uh, basically says that uh, any way, waste is defined as that loss that society experiences, uh, right? As a result yeah. of not, right? Uh, 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 as, as a result, as a result of that. So, yeah. That I gotta almost tell my, I gotta tell my story on purchasing uh, at Motorola. So I'm, I'm, I'm supporting purchasing, and they have the, uh, they have everybody from the mo world of Motorola come into Schaumburg, Illinois, into the big conference, uh, conference room that they have. Not a conference room; it's an auditorium. And uh, the head of purchasing is telling a story about, you know, uh, purchasing's role in the future is going to change dramatically. We're putting CAD CAM systems out there on the factories. So this was before computers hit the factory floors. It was going to change everything. So we have this thing called standard parts inventories that are part of the CAD CAM systems, so that you would design stuff. So your job as purchasing agents is to stop all those engineers who don't want to use the screw that's in the standard parts inventory. They want to specify something that's this much different. <laughs> and he's, and he, so he's telling you, he says, you're going to have to do that. And that's different than you just, you know, figuring out, you know, what they want. And you go sourcing suppliers for that and doing all that stuff. No. So let me tell you the story. He said, Toyota, after World War II, used, well, today they use seven fasteners to assemble their cars and trucks, seven. That's bolts and screws and clips, seven. Mm. 
And uh, if you, it, it's okay for an engineer to specify something other than those seven, but they have to get the CEO's approval before it'll be put in motion. So of course, no one ever went and did that. And he says, so they use seven and General Motors, how many does General Motors use? And he went and he got, went, went to the side of the stage and got a cup of coffee and came over to the podium and drank that cup of coffee. He's looking around, he says, 19,000. Who has the cost advantage? He takes another sip of coffee, walks it back over the cup over and puts it down here and comes back to the podium and looks out and he goes, that's what we're doing. We've got to reduce all of our inventories of all these parts, all these things that are different that didn't need to be. We're going to have to reduce our standard parts inventories because we can't afford to do what General Motors is doing. We cannot afford to validate the sources of supply and the quality of their production efforts to know that we're buying quality. We can't afford to do that. We're gonna to have to begin to limit what we're doing. And this is a sea change for the world. And so the engineers who now have CAD CAM systems to design things here, they're gonna see that that standard parts inventory that they're pulling from to create their designs isn't giving them exactly what they need and they're going to have to learn to use just what we have in that system here and we're going to have to start limiting what we do um just like we in training uh the i did a thing with the norfolk naval shipyard and uh, for production uh, supervisors and zone managers and one of the enabling knowledge and skills was active listening so as i said earlier i always go and look at what the existing content is that we have for the client well, the client wanted to do that part of the pro of the effort to reduce their costs. So my client went out and found all the active listening courses that the United States Navy had for the people working at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. And there were 27 two-hour modules on active listening. So he watched 54 hours of, of, of uh, e-learning to decide what two hours we were going to use in our curriculum design. We don't have control over our content. We recreate the wheel over and over again. And it's just not first costs, it's life cycle costs for maintaining all that stuff. Just like my bank example had three sets of curricula and the maintenance was killing them because regulatory agencies were changing things state by state and you'd have to keep all your content up to date. And they were doing it three times more over, you know, what they need, what the minimum would have been to keep it up to date. So we need better ways of reusing content, which means we need to figure out how to do a CAD CAM system of standard parts inventories of content that we can use as is and modify. We can bookend generic content with here's what your job is. This is why you're going to learn this generic content. They call it the, we call it the, don't be confused, but you're going to see the a lot when you go through it go through that generic content, come out and bookend on the other side is here's your specific applications. And remember, we don't call it the, we call it the, carry on. And so we need to have more of a mindset of being in a product and service business where we can share a lot of content. We just have to have the kind of standard parts inventory and inventory numbering schemes and give people access to those things. It's what content management systems do for media companies. You know, they can take a story and put it out on the TV, radio, newspaper, and magazine. It's all from the same root story, but they have, they can manipulate it and do different things with it and reduce their cost to be in all those businesses and they have all those channels. But, but so there's lessons for us to learn. And as you had indicated, you know, there's all this new technology coming out and companies need to find a way to stay abreast of that. Yeah. And leadership needs to figure out how to divide and conquer, you know, people who are watching, where's the technology that we could be using? Where's it going? What technology are we using? What's being displaced by newer, better, and faster? And it's actually cheaper to make the switch than to stick with the old. Um, so leadership has got a, a lot of challenges, I think, in our business here. And we're focused a lot on the individual instructional designer, instructional system designer, learning experience designer. Have we prepared them to really be effective? Have we given them the uh, their own performance context that's conducive to them doing what we need them to do? And I think that we are, again, opportunity rich in all of that. 
Well, I absolutely concur. Um, what a great conversation, man. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for, like, I, I mean, I feel like we could do a whole series of uh, just talking about uh, all the different aspects that we were, uh, that we touched on. Uh, I definitely agreed before that we went well beyond the original one hour uh, scheduled time. And I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I look up to you a great deal, and and I'm very grateful for the work and the body of work that you've uh, that you've produced over the years, and it's been very helpful to me. Um, you know, just uh, uh, there's very few people that have the enterprise uh, curriculum architecture mindset, and uh, I think that your work. Uh, does a great job of that. I just became aware of Elaine. Elaine B- Bitch. Uh, how do you how, do you know how you say her last I, name? I don't, know how to, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Yeah. Uh, I'd uh, be careful uh, with that. Right, right. I know yeah. she's right out of uh, uh, Richmond, and I definitely want to get it right. Uh, but yeah, she's got a book that I haven't read yet called uh, TQM for training. And um, I've got Gilbert's, you know, uh, human performance engine. Uh, now this is Bailey, sorry, Bailey's human performance engineering right next to Gilbert's uh, human com- competence engineering worthy performance. And um, uh, but Carl Cap actually, one of his lesser known books is all about uh, learning, you know, pl- planning out learning uh, uh, interventions for enterprise resource. Uh, uh, you know, you, you know, uh, planning, uh, you know, ERP programs. Yeah. And it was one uh, of his first assignments. I did a video with him uh, a year or two ago, and we talked a little bit about that, uh, where, where he kind of got some of his foundational thinking. But there's many people who think like that. And I think it's more of a kind of an engineering technician kind of a mindset to instruction rather than what I would say uh, disparagingly. The marketing and sales, lots of balloons and fancy colors, and then lots to go play golf. Um, so the, so what we're doing is we are creating engineered products. And so the whole total quality management movement and, and a lot of tools that can be adapted or used as is for our needs to define, you know, standard work processes on a Lean Six Sigma. You know, that's, you know, what is the standard work process? It's not a, a concept that's unique to instructional design. In fact, we're, we're the laggards and, and the quality movement are the people who are at the forefront of some of those things. So, you know, a lot of times we, we have people talk about how we should learn and from marketing and all of that. I think we need to get our engineering and our quality approaches in place first before we worry about learning from marketing and all that. Now, there's a place for all of that to come uh, and, and affect how we do our work, but we don't have the right focus too often where we shouldn't be worried about, you know, what can we learn from marketing? I think that's secondary in my view. Yeah, there is a, I uh, went to ITSEC. Uh, for 2019, the last one that was done in person. And while there, they were introducing, uh, with much fanfare, uh, the concept of learning engineering and how learning engineering. And and one of the things that I was dismayed by was they essentially said uh, over and over again that the focus of a learning engineer was that you had to use, you know, had to base all of your decisions on evidence. It had to be, uh, you had to have pr- approach it using the systemic approach, the systemic iterative approach. You had to be able to have this professional rigor that was assigned to that. And I said, what's the difference between this and what an instructional system designer is supposed to be, exactly. right? And, and the, learning, the learning engineering term goes back decades, uh, five or six decades. So it's kind of an old term that's being revived lately. So you can search for that on online. And I forget the name of the of the where that came from, but it came out, I believe, some university and some professor, but it's the same concepts, you know, so we're, we're, we're continually reinventing the re- wheel, changing our language, you know, now we call it learning experience design when it could have been performance based instruction. And learning experience design could say it's a great experience, but it's got nothing to do with, you know, we're trying to inspire you rather than teach you a skill or uh, how to perform. 
So it's a cloudy feel with, you know, a lot of fuzziness to things. And so I think it just helps to clarify. But but there are a lot of people that, you know, from the old days, they're now long gone, you know, no longer with us that we can learn from because they learned lessons and they that they could share with us that would affect our performance and help us do better today. But there are certainly a lot of people nowadays that are on the scene now that you can learn from. And we, you know, I remember Joe Harless telling me about he and the competitive nature with he and, and uh, Bill Dederline and Gary Rumler and all these same group of people, they used to compete against each other for clients. And then when they got, somebody got the job, they'd hire the other guys. And so, but they had to differentiate themselves. So they changed the language so that all these models and frameworks and approaches they have are pretty much the same. They're just slightly different. And we get too caught up in the differences and all that stuff, but it's just like engineering any, you know, Rumler was an engineer. Um, a lot of the people that were in, in our world that I think were very successful started off as engineers. Um, so they just kind of thought that way. And other people that weren't engineers kind of thought that way, too. Um, it's like physicists for, uh, you know, Goldratt was a physicist and Deming was a physicist. And yeah. Yeah. And so, the, you know, the, there's so many things that we could learn from the early quality movement from Duran and Deming, both out of uh, Western Electric and uh, Short who, you know, the Deming cycle is really the Schuert cycle, but, you know, so somehow all this stuff gets changed and people go, are those, are those different? Well, some people have changed the language in the Deming cycle, but, but, uh, so there's, yeah, there's plan, a lot. Do check act, plan, do study act, right? Yeah. yeah, there's, there's slight differences in all this stuff. And so it just makes it harder for the new people coming in. Um, and so, you know, what, what kind of guidance, you know, people need to look at their networks. So now, you know, networks in the back in the day, in my early days was going to local chapter meetings and going to national conferences. There was ASTD, now ATD. Uh, there was NSPI, now ISPI. There was Lakewood conferences, now training conferences. And there's just a plethora of them. So how, how to assess the quality of your network. It's like your mom used to say, you know, be careful who your friends are, you know? So be careful who your network is and who's in your network and are they promoting evidence-based, what used to be called research-based kinds of things or are they promoting myths? Now we may have all been subject to myths back in our time, but did we learn, did we, did we figure it out that, you know, learning styles does not hold any merit, generational differences does not, and on and on and on. Um, there, so people coming in new have this challenge. There's more that they are confronted with than I was back in 1979. There weren't a lot of books. There weren't a lot of educational programs in instructional technology. I learned from things that I picked up at conferences and, at, and, at, and presentations at local chapters. So nowadays it's actually easier to get access to them. It's just that there's so many of them that there's so much content out there. And a lot of that qu content is, I think, of dubious value. Sure. And, I, I love what you say people. about the 70-20-10 model is that it should be the inverse, you know, the 10 the 10, 20, 70, yeah. Well, if you have to use the numbers, but then, you know, so that's like, <laughs> you know, Six Sigma isn't really about 3.4 failures per million opportunities to do so. It's really, you know, it could be hundreds or thousands, but, you know, we like to call it Six Sigma. So that's my only knock on that. So there's, there's value in there. It's just unfortunate that, you know, that they use a set of numbers, you know, rounded numbers, which are always, you know, that's, that's, the first thing that catches my eye, but but it's not that the, the the idea is that the notion that we learn a lot informally, mostly because our formal learning doesn't go teach us all the way to the end. And even if it did, there's other situations and things where we're going to learn informally or we're going to learn socially. So, it's a big mix. Uh, we can do the formal things on the on the high stakes performance and let all of the rest go to informal and social means. We do not need to try to tackle everything under the sun from a learning standpoint. After all, all learning started off as informal. And maybe we should wrap on that note. Yeah, it's good stuff. Thank you for, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. EJ, thank you. Thank Carry you. on. Sharp.